weekend. Uh, coming up at one right here, Majid Nawaz, next on ABC and live from Westminster down the road, Tom Swarbrick. Morning. Morning, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, morning, everybody. Welcome to the show. At 10 o'clock, wash your hands, cover your face indoors and keep your distance from others. You must all stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. The chief medical officer in a stark warning about the state of hospitals. It has never been worse than this. There are more men in their 40s in intensive care with COVID-19 than there are people 85 plus. The government said to be increasingly concerned about compliance during the toughest of the three lockdowns. Reports this morning also suggest that pubs and bars won't start opening before the end of March, even if the vaccination plan works out. We'll speak live to the people deciding who gets the jab after the news at 10. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 10 o'clock, people in England who are not showing any coronavirus symptoms are to be prioritised for the rollout of new rapid testing from this week. Ministers are encouraging those who can't work from home to be at the front of the queue, such as supermarket workers and taxi drivers. It says England's chief medical officer, Chris Whitty, is warning the NHS faces the most dangerous situation in living memory. Hena Anwar is an NHS doctor and says it's vital the public stick to the lockdown rules to give the health service some respite. We are living through times that we haven't lived through before. It feels like some days we don't know what's going to happen next. And when we when we see the number of cases rising, it feels overwhelming. It can feel overwhelming, which is why it's extremely important for people to continue following the rules. Thousands of people over the age of 80 have started receiving letters inviting them to be inoculated at COVID-19 vaccination centres. NHS England say around 130,000 initial invitations have landed on doormats this weekend. Officials in Indonesia say they believe they found the site where a passenger plane crashed shortly after takeoff yesterday. It's thought more than 60 people were on board the Boeing 737-500 when it disappeared from radars minutes after takeoff. The country's president is Joko Widodo. We will do our best to find and save the victims, and together, let's pray that they can be found. In the name of the government and the Indonesian people, we would like to express our condolences for what has happened. The Home Secretary has warned police will not hesitate to enforce lockdown rules in England. Priti Patel has defended the way officers have handled breaches and say rising numbers of COVID-19 cases illustrate the need for strong enforcement. The outgoing US Vice President Mike Pence has confirmed he is to attend Joe Biden's inauguration ceremony later this month. Donald Trump has signalled earlier this week he won't be attending. And the non-league side Marine are hoping to pull off a major upset when they face Tottenham this afternoon. The eighth-tier side welcome the Premier League club to Merseyside in an FA Cup third-round tie, which represents the biggest gap between two teams in the history of the competition. And the weather, freezing fog and low cloud may be slow to clear from southern areas this morning. Some patchy cloud and sunny spells in central areas. Cloudier further north with some showers. Highs of 7 degrees. From Global's Newsroom, I'm Dominic Ellis. LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick, live from Westminster. It's gone 10. Very good morning to you. You are listening to Swarbrick on Sunday on LBC. I'm Tom Swarbrick. Hope we find you very well this chilly morning. On the show, the woman placed in handcuffs for sitting on a beach. The police authorised to go through the gears to crack down on COVID rule breakers as a fine for two friends walking in Derbyshire looks like is going to be rescinded. Lateral flow tests now being offered to people without symptoms from tomorrow. Uh, some boroughs of the capital say one in 20 people 
are now carrying the virus. And as Trump is banned from Twitter, we'll speak to the company's former vice president. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Very good morning to you. The message couldn't be clearer, and yet Downing Street and the senior medics are worried that you're not hearing it. COVID-19, especially the new variant, is spreading quickly across the country. This puts many people at risk of serious disease and is placing a lot of pressure on our NHS. Once more, we must all stay home. Chief Medical Officer Chris Whitty laying out a stark picture this morning. Emergency patients, he says, will be turned away from hospitals, causing unavoidable deaths unless the public starts obeying the lockdown. Hospitals are now facing the worst crisis in living memory, according to the Chief Medical Officer. The situation most acute, it seems, in London, where, of course, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, declared a major incident and where, in some boroughs, as many as one in 20 now has the virus. Clearly, government is worried about why, it seems, more people are not following the lockdown. And I just wonder whether you are seeing that. Are you seeing more people not complying, a general flouting of the rules? Or is it that, possibly until now, the measures have actually allowed you to do things that nevertheless saw the virus spread? You have actually been following the rules, but it's the rules that haven't been tight enough. 0345 6060973. We'll get a view from John Apter in just a moment, the National Chair of the Police Federation of England and Wales, about what it is police officers are now being asked to do. First, James Goodison is LBC's reporter at Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel with the details of the difficulties now faced by the NHS. Morning to you, James. Well, good morning, Tom. It's been very bad few days in terms of coronavirus across the country. Of course, yesterday, the death toll for the pandemic here in the UK hit 80,000. Now, the difference between when we hit 70,000 and 80,000 was just 15 days to get from 60,000 to 70,000. It took 22. So that number is increasing and increasing rapidly. And of course, the figures yesterday meant that the UK became the first country in Western Europe to register over 3 million cases. Here, as you say, a state of emergency called in London, joining places like Thames Valley, Sussex and other places up and down the country that have announced it. And here at the hospital, it really does sum up the situation that London is in. This is part of Bart's Health Trust. They have five big hospitals in the capital and they have decided that all coronavirus patients must come here to be treated so that the other hospitals across the capital have what they're calling some breathing room. Just to put this into perspective in comparison to the first wave last year, March, April 2020, hospitals currently have across the country 46% more people in with coronavirus than they did back then. So you can see how much bigger the workload is that they're dealing with. And Chris Whitty saying that the NHS is living through its most difficult situation in living memory. Now, all of this is prompting calls from scientists in some parts for further restrictions, but we're in lockdown. What more can be done? A few things that have changed since the first lockdown and indeed the November one, for example, places of worship are still open. There are calls for them to be closed, just to give one example, and a few other things like that, but nothing major uh, can, can really change. What we're really looking at is, aside from these further restrictions, how is enforcement and making sure the message comes across to the public to stay at home? We've seen Chris Whitty do that announcement, part of that ad campaign. You played some of it just now. It's all part of that movement to try and convince people to stay at home. But we have seen figures from TfL that shows that across the board on buses, on trains, mm. people are moving a lot more than the first lockdown. The second thing is issuing fines. The National Police Chiefs Council has told officers uh, to make sure that they issue fines after a, a gentle reminder. Pretty Patel agrees with that as well. So we may see more fines. A few examples, as you've seen, at the, the beach and the incident in, in Derbyshire with two people walking five miles away uh, are stories that are cropping up. But clearly the government feeling like they need to get the message across to the British psyche that this is a really dangerous time. 
James Goodison, LBC's reporter at the Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel. Many thanks indeed. By um, way of emphasising that, I see a Home Office official is quoted in one of the papers this morning saying, if there was a gunman who killed a thousand people yesterday running around the country and the government said stay at home, everyone would say, OK, I'll do that. I won't go for a coffee with some friends and walk around the park. Is that the kind of message that needs to be enforced? Let's turn to John Apter, National Chair of the Police Federation of England and Wales. Thank you for coming on the programme this morning, Mr Apter. Um, the police to we're told that the police are going to be going through the gears and issuing fines pretty much immediately. Is that the right approach? Uh, yeah, good morning, Tom. It it's, comes as no surprise, and I think that's how we've been evolving throughout this crisis, that the policing style has had to change. We've always stuck to the principles of the um, engagement, enforcement uh, coming at the very end, but engagement and encouragement um, being a core principle of what we've been trying to achieve. But the rules are well known by many people. Of course, we could do with more clarity, especially when the rules are changing so quickly and so rapidly. But the problem is, Tom, what, what we have, and this is where police officers get so disheartened, I'll be honest, because we really are trying our best in the most unprecedented of times. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of encounters across the country every day between police and the public. The vast, vast majority of them unremarkable. Some people will get fixed penalty notice, others won't. But what we tend to see in the media, and I understand why, are those things that really grab the headlines. And certainly within protests, what we're seeing is uh, we have agitators. So people who want to make their point, and they will generally find people who look quite vulnerable on camera, maybe an elderly person who will refuse to move. And as soon as police officers encounter them and start to ask them to move on, the cameras will come out and it'll be all over social media and the police officers and the villains of this pandemic. Whereas I, in reality... I think, Mr Acton, most, most reasonable people understand that, that these are isolated incidents. Hopefully they remain isolated incidents, but they say something, yeah. don't they? And if, and, and if unfortunately, police officers have misinterpreted the, the ever-changing legal guidance, yeah. uh, well, not guidance, the, the law, if they've misinterpreted it and misapplied it, then the public has a right to expect the police to, to take another look at it, as is happening in Derbyshire with the case of these two women who were, who were found to be walking. Are are you are you convinced that the majority of police officers know what the limits of their powers now are? Yeah, I, I do um, think uh, that officers know what the the law is. The issue is it's how it changes so rapidly and the guidance. There's a lot of confusion, certainly with the public, understandably, between what's the law and what's guidance. So let's use the example in Derbyshire. So this is about how far do you travel. That is not written down in law. It's in guidance. No. You would hope that most reasonable people would know that we're in the middle of a, uh, of a pandemic which is killing many, many thousands of people. You're not going to travel too far if you don't have to. So would, it be, would it be more helpful that. if it were put into legislation, Mr Apter, that legislation said you cannot travel more than five miles from your 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 home if that's what's needed then that's what's needed the problem is though tom different geographical areas so if, if you if you feel you have to drive for exercise then you need to rationalize that with yourself my view is exercise for me is walking around the block or walking around a local park that i can walk to but that's me somebody else what they think is reasonable is driving five miles to go to a beauty spot um it's trying to find that balance that's where we need the help of government um, to really pin that down but we're in a crisis oh, and yeah. we have to react accordingly um, obviously we're in a crisis and obviously the police are being asked to step up and you're receiving, the police are receiving backing from, from senior government ministers this morning about how they're dealing with this. Um, how is everything else going? I mean, I realise that there are other crimes that are being reported all the time. Um, are you worried that at some stage the, the demand of police is going to be so great that other investigations, other crimes being reported are going to have to drop off? Well, I, I think we reached that point some time ago. Certainly in the first lockdown early last year, it was very, very different. Um, and I think there was a large uh, number of people complying. All the crime rates plummeted. But there was still demand. There was still domestic violence going on. There were still assaults against police officers. In fact, that increased. And what we've seen is the increasing number of other types of crime, although it peaks and troughs. So police officers at the moment, not only are they trying to police the pandemic, they're still answering the 999 calls. They're still mm. dealing with all of the, the, the other crime. At the same time, there's fewer of them because more and more of them are getting struck down with this virus themselves or having to self-isolate. Um, it, it's a, it's not, not a great picture. 
No. And just finally, Mr. Apter, people listening to this will say that we are on the verge of police state stuff here. If everybody is being asked at any given moment by a police officer, where are you going? What are you doing? Show us your papers, please. Words to that effect. Then people are going to start to really question the idea of policing by consent. Do you think we are in danger of eroding that premise? Uh, I think there's a real risk about the relationship with the, with, between police and public. And look, out on the streets, I'm getting examples where my colleagues, when they get cameras shoved in their face, they're getting called Nazis and we live in a police state. I think people who say that we're living in a police state need to live in a police state to see what it's really like. Um, of course, the relationship is important, but we just want everybody to try and do all, the very best to get us out of this crisis and save lives and protect the NHS. It's a, it's a broken record um, comment, but it's an important one. Good to talk to you, John. Thank you, John Apter. You're the National Chair of the Police Federation of England and Wales. We've got these um, th these two incidents that have gained the, the sort of national media prominence. This in incident in Derbyshire uh, and on the beach, down on the beach, where a lady said that she was uh, arrested by police for just sitting on a bench. Um, you've got concerns, too, about whether these incidents where police may have overstretched their powers, leading to a lack of, of trust in the police, and so people deciding that they're going to flout the rules anyway because they don't trust that the police will enforce it properly. If you are in the police force, we can anonymise you wherever abouts in the country you are. How are you finding having to deal with this? Is it right that you're being given greater powers or you're being told you can go further in enforcing the law here? Because what we're seeing is, whether it's the numbers going into hospital, we are seeing a breaking of the law when it comes to the lockdown restrictions. And now is the time to enforce it given just how critical the state is in the NHS. 0345 6060 973 84850 to text. You can, of course, tweet at LBC. We'll come on to some of your calls in just a few moments. Tom Swarbrick here, 1016. This is LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060973. Morning to you, 10.19 is the time. Tom Swarbrick with you this morning here on LBC. I hope we find you very well. We've got a very, very desperate situation in the NHS, certainly according to the Chief Medical Officer Chris Whitty, who says at no time in its history has the NHS come under pressure like this. That is in part because too many people are not obeying the rules and therefore some of them are ending up in hospital, too many of them are ending up in hospital. And so the police are getting a much tougher approach to enforcing the laws that now exist around lockdown. Um, there are those who served in the police force, certainly a uh, former Chief Constable, Mike Barton, who used to run Durham Police, who's saying that actually the greater and tougher enforcement of the rules, overzealous enforcement by police, is going to damage the public support for restrictions because people will believe officers are acting unfairly, according to this former Chief Constable. If you've had contact with a police officer around the COVID restrictions over the course of the last few days, how have you found the approach? Has it, in your view, been overzealous and unfair? Or is now the time to actually actually do something about those people who are breaking the restrictions, or at least to ask people, where are you going? What are you doing? Why are you with this particular person? As they go around and, and move, if you're not breaking the law, if you know the laws, and if you're not breaking them, I guess some people might feel, well, what have they got to worry about? 0345 973 Let's come to Mike, who's in Streatham this morning. Hiya, Mike. Morning, Tom. First time on your show. You oh. are more than welcome. Thank you. I'll be brief because I know lots of people want to talk. Um, I run a friends group in my local park. And just a couple of months ago, we had some football pitches installed, a complete uh, 11 aside end to end and three five aside within the, the, the actual pitch itself. Now, um, over this lockdown, particularly this last serious lockdown, there have been people there every day just, just uh, ignoring the rules. Yesterday, I counted wait for it, in excess of 35 people inside those pitches. Mm. There were groups of 6 to 10-year-olds being trained by adults, so there were lots of adults with them, and there was a full five, uh, 11 aside going on down the other end. And I just politely say to these people, look, you're not supposed to be in there. Uh, no outside games. There's a lockdown. And they turn around uh, and say, oh, no, we're not, when I say you're breaking the rules. Or they either just ignore me completely, just turn back round and just carry on. So, so what did you do? I have called the police on several oh. occasions. I surreptitiously disappear around the park just to keep an eye, just to see how long they took. Now, yesterday, it was 40 minutes, no sign of them. So I just went home. Mm. And I, I, I just, I just, I despair. I really do. Unless people have just arrived from Mars, what are they thinking about? Mm. We've got a serious... So Pandemic you think, Mike, here, uh, based, on, based on, yeah, but based on your experience, Mike, you're, you're more, more lethal than the original uh, virus. Well, it's not more lethal. Let's be careful. It's not more lethal. It, it's certainly more transmissible, but it's not seventy percent more yeah, lethal. Sorry, but but Mike, so your view would be based on what you've seen that actually the, the the risk is not that the public aren't going to comply because the police are deemed to be overzealous and unfair. The yeah. risk is actually that the public isn't complying anyway, and so the police Absolutely. must start to get tougher. That's your view. Yeah. And I think the police's job now is beyond the point where they should be politely advising and say, look, you shouldn't be here, go home. I think now people know what the rules are. The, the police should be arriving with these people in, the, in these pitches, getting their names and finding them, frankly. Well, look, Mike, if, if they're breaking the law, then the police absolutely should be doing that, I agree. But the difficult some instances here, particularly the one in Derbyshire, it looks as though it may be the case that the police that didn't actually, they went further than the law um, allowed them to go and so may have to rescind it. Listen, Mike, I, I realise, thank you for your call, I realise that there are plenty of people around the country who are worried about those they see breaking those restrictions, not least because of the problems it presents for the health service further down the line. 10.23, let's get more on that. Dr Claudia Paoloni joins us, President of the Hospital Consultant Specialist Association and Consultant Anaesthetist. Anaesthet <laughs> <laughs> I'll get my teeth in in a minute, Doctor. Easy for me <laughs> to say. Thank, thank, thank you for being there. Um, so Chris Whitty has been uh, absolutely stark in saying no other time has been worse than this for the NHS. Would you agree? Absolutely. That I don't think any of us have lived through anything like this ever before. And I'm quite long in the tooth in the in the realms of the NHS world. So, um, yes, this is an extraordinary situation we find ourselves in right now. 
Well, describe it for us. But I mean, put that into some context because I think there might be some people who would would criticise by saying we've heard a lot of times about how much of a crisis the NHS has been in. Where every winter we seem to have another N- NHS crisis. Lay it out to us how bad this is. Okay, so yes, they and they would be right that every year we are in crisis. What we have, but it's to a much smaller degree than the current one. Uh, which is because we don't have um, vast amounts of hospital bed capacity compared to other countries in Europe, for instance. So this is something that has actually happened over a period of years, the, the situation that we're in now. Um, but what we, the reality of what we have now is we have ambulances queuing up outside hospitals unable to unload their patients. If you can't unload your ambulance, you can't go to someone else. And therefore, you're not available for someone else who might need it for either COVID or non-COVID. You could be having a heart attack, a stroke. You might have been involved in a car accident. So all these things need access, immediate and access to NHS hospitals. They need to be t- treated in a timely way. And, that's and if, not capacity even- is the, if capacity is the problem, what's your view then of, of the nightingales not being stood up around the country or some of them not being stood up or some of them not being able to be staffed? Absolutely not surprised that we can't because we have been understaffed for years and that's one of the other problems. You came into this pandemic seriously understaffed. We had over 100,000 vacancies within the NHS. So, um, and whilst you know we're very grateful for all the volunteers that have tried to come in um, and help, all the people that have come out of retirement to try and help, critical care, when you're looking at critical care capacity, which is what we are seeing as being breached especially in the London hospitals, but is now starting to be impacted throughout the country Mm. from um, the members' reports. Critical care, um, medicine and nursing is a highly specialist field. It takes years to train for that. So when that is overwhelmed at the way that it is being or starting to be now, so that normally in normal times you would have one nurse looking after one patient, but now you need one nurse to look after three or four patients supported by people who don't have that as their specialty. Yes. You can see how the stress, the exhaustion and the risk goes up around that care. I also um, wonder to what extent you are concerned by, as is reported this morning in The Observer, that uh, 46,000 hospital staff are currently off sick with coronavirus. Does that indicate to you that hospital staff, whether they're uh, working in intensive care or wherever they are in the hospital, in fact, anybody working in hospital has to jump to the top of the vaccination queue? We are calling for that. We are seriously concerned because that's actually approximately 6% of the hospital um, staff population that are already going off sick. And if they're not available, either because they're sick themselves or they're self-isolating, that has a massive impact on those left behind who are trying to do the catch-up work. And we are, which is one of the reasons we are very concerned, especially about the second dose lag on the Pfizer vaccine, for which there isn't the data to support it. We understand Mm. the logic of extending the time between first and second doses of vaccinations to get more people vaccinated. Totally support that, especially with the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, where there's full data to support that. But where we have actually, the healthcare workers that were the most vulnerable have been put forward for a first dose of a Pfizer vaccine and now can't get the second dose, it seems illogical that there's that additional risk around that when mm. we should be, when we need every single healthcare worker to be safe, to be able to work, we aren't actually taking a precautionary approach with that. I'll, I'll put that to the JCVI, the people that decide the, the vaccine especially when they're on the programme a bit later. Um, let me just ask you this, just finally, I realise it's very, very morbid, so apologies in advance, but you talk about pressure on hospitals getting into hospitals, on ambulance, on every stage of the sort of the process through the hospital. I've got to ask you about, given the number of deaths, the pressure on on hospital mortuaries. Have you got enough space? Um, I don't have the figures of the host, uh, on the mortuary space um, situations. Our members haven't been coming to us because we represent the the medical workforce. Mm-hmm. So I'm not aware of that um, current situation. But it would be logical that we are going to be struggling with that. And I know in the first wave that um, the undertakers and funeral services were helping out. Thank you for your time. Good to talk to you, Dr. Claudia Paoloni, President of the Hospital Consultant Specialist Association and a consultant anaesthetist, nearly. Uh, let's go to Charlotte in Chelmsford before the news at 10.30. Morning, Charlotte. Morning. Thanks for having me. You're more than welcome. Um, it was just 
just really regarding the restrictions, I mean, I suppose it depends on where you live. But where I live, the streets are full of people, like more than they have ever been, because people really? are choosing not to drive. So they are following the rules, but then... So I've got a young family. I haven't got family in 10 miles of where I live. Um, I have a two-year-old. Getting out, especially when it's thick with mud and the weather's miserable, is really, really difficult. Um, yep. So we do drive to somewhere that is hard ground and is less busy. Um, and if I, I, you know, if I couldn't do that, we wouldn't get out the house. Um, no, I, Charlotte, I'm with you on that. It, uh, I've got a five-year-old and a three-year-old, and the, it it's takes so forever to get out the house. And they don't understand. I know, but I, know. I think the biggest but, thing I wanted to say, really, is to do with the breaking of restrictions. Yeah. I think the biggest issue is the restrictions have actually been contradictory from the beginning in March. Every single rule and regulation has had an an element that does not make logical sense. But so, Charlotte, if you were um, told, if you were told, sorry to interrupt, but if you were told by a police officer who stopped you as you were driving your two-year-old to whichever place you were going so that they weren't getting caked in mud, and the police officer said, well, you're a bit far from home, I'm afraid, um, so and you have to do it I'd locally, so tough, I'm afraid I'm going to slap a fine. Tough. <laughs> because my family live 10 miles away. If I cannot drive to them just to go and have a socially distance walk, I mean, my mum died at the beginning of last year. We've stuck to the rules all year long, and it, what good has it done us? So if I can't go and at least have a socially distance walk with my family member away from my baby on my own, I really don't see the issue. I mean, right. you have to also think that less than a couple of months ago, I couldn't work as a hairdresser one-on-one -on -one in full PPE, but I could go to a restaurant and have yeah. dinner with people. No, Charlotte, listen, I, 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 I get it. And the, frustra the frustrations for people in your industry in particular must be absolutely massive. And the time... You know, anyone. What what is the definition of local? It it's, totally depends based on who you are, which is presumably why it only exists as guidance rather than as law, because it gives the police some scope to to have a discussion with with somebody that they come across, rather than having to enforce something that would perhaps mean, Charlotte, you wouldn't be able to go and see uh, your mum for that socially distanced walk. Thank you for your call. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Again, if you are a police officer, having to try and force enforce this must be a nightmare. When you see the stories in the papers of of people being picked up for sitting on a park bench or uh, those two people in Derbyshire who were going out for a perfectly fine social distance walk but who were doing it some distance from their own home. I wonder what you make about the damage that that does, that those incidents do, to public trust and public confidence. 0345 6060 973. Take more of your calls in a moment. Plus, after the news headlines, we'll talk to a member of Nerve Tag. That is the new and emerging respiratory virus threats advisory group, you heard, about the changes that have been made to the border restrictions that we've seen come into force in England and Scotland. You're listening to Swarbrick on Sunday, LBC. Tom Swarbrick here, 10.32. News headlines this morning, Dominic Ellis. Rapid testing for people without coronavirus symptoms is to be rolled out across England this week. The government are encouraging those who can't work from home to be put to the front of the queue. Thousands of people over the age of 80 have started receiving letters inviting them to be inoculated at COVID-19 vaccination centres. NHS England say around 130,000 invitations have been sent, with more than half a million to follow. And the head of the Police Federation of England and Wales has told LBC officers need more clarity from ministers on lockdown rules. John Apter says officers are under pressure to do the right thing under a constantly changing landscape. And the weather, freezing fog and low cloud may be slow to clear from southern areas this morning. Patchy cloud and some sunshine in central parts. Cloudier further north with showers. Highs of 7 degrees. This is LBC.
This is LBC, Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick. Live from Westminster, call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. 10.36 is the time. This is what you're saying about the policing. Tom, all working people should also be vaccinated against COVID, otherwise it's a losing battle, says Abdul. We'll put some of that to the uh, the Joint uh, Centre for Vaccinations when they come on just after the news at 11. Uh, Tom, I had to take some food to my elderly parents yesterday, a journey of about four or five, five miles. I was absolutely astounded to see the volume of traffic and groups of people literally everywhere. There were queues to get into parks with local roads packed with parked cars and a line of 10 people to get coffee from the cafe in my local supermarket, says this texter. To be honest, where where we are, we're in Kent, um, and it's been pretty quiet, I have to say, both on the roads and on the pavements. I think it's been relatively quiet. Although I have started to see, and you can see why it happens, um, for childcare support reasons. Every now and again, you you wander around, and you think mm, more than four mums there pushing their prams together. I know that mothers' meetings help, are helpful at times, but that's not really in the spirit of the, some of the restrictions. Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three is my number. Come back to more of your calls on this in just a few moments. But I'm joined live by Professor Peter Openshaw, who is professor of experimental medicine at Imperial College London, former president of the British uh, pre- president of the British Society for Immunology, and a member of Nerve Tag, the new and emerging respiratory virus threats advisory group. Right, I've got your title out now, Peter. I can actually ask you some questions. <laughs> Thank you very much for being there for us. Um, one of your members is Professor Neil Ferguson, uh, dubbed Professor Lockdown, who is suggesting that because the uh, rates of transmission are now much higher, uh, he is saying that herd immunity in places like London uh, may well be occurring. Maybe he says 25 or 30% of the population has now been infected in the first wave and second wave. So that adds Adds to the reduction of transmission. Are we seeing greater levels of herd immunity? Well, we're not seeing the greater reductions in transmission that we really, really need to see at the moment. We've got to get this under control. The, the, the what I'm hearing from colleagues who are working at the front line in the health service is that we're completely overwhelmed. Um, and I think we mustn't underestimate the importance of doing everything we can to stop transmission. And some people are doing doing really really well in terms of of trying to isolate themselves and not pass it on but it's so important now that we get transmission Mm. down do you think we've got uh restrictions tight enough to get transmission down at this stage the trouble is that we've we've really got an epidemic on top of a pandemic you know we've got this the pandemic of coronavirus and then we've got this new variant the B1.1.7 variant, which came out of southern Britain, which is now really spread and replaced um, most other circulation of virus in the country. And with the increased um, transmissibility, you know, it's, it's between 50 and 70 percent more transmissible. The sort of lockdown measures that we had before are just not enough unless everyone observes them absolutely. And we just got to um, apply the rules and and get the uh, transmission down. So right, does that right mean? Down. Yeah, I understand that. So does that mean that you you don't think there is much left to play with in terms of more that could close, um, or that the enforcement of the current rules, if the enforcement is done properly, then that should that should do the job of knocking this on the head. I don't. I- I don't know that using the term enforcement is is the is what we should be doing. I think people need to understand to take personal responsibility for this. I mean, the police can't possibly go around and uh, and tell people not to queue for coffee and not to uh, play sport in the park. It would be easier if I mean you could are. you could you could remove those queues by um, just shutting the, the the ability for people to t- get takeaway coffee down. Yes, it's so important that people actually take personal responsibility for this. And it's it's not a trade-off between, you know, okay, we can have we can allow some deaths in order to open up commerce. You know, we, if you look internationally, you can see that the countries that actually did take lockdown seriously and drove numbers right right down are the countries which are now doing very well economically. You know, China and Vietnam and Australia and New Zealand, yes. they've done really well because they got numbers right down. And that's what we well, have me, to do yeah. now. Let me ask about that, because um, one of the ways those countries, uh, they say, aided their ability to get on top of coronavirus early was airport screening. Um, 
Do you think it's a good idea to introduce this 72-hour testing time for um, people coming into the country via ports and airports? Well, it could possibly help a bit. I mean, I would say that airport screening is not my expertise. <laughs> but if you think about it, we've got one of the highest coronavirus infection rates in the world. And um, people coming from overseas, maybe from areas that are less likely to um, mean that they're carrying coronavirus, you know, mm -hmm. are not the major danger at the moment. The major danger is the vast numbers of people within our shores who are now infected and are now a risk to others and to themselves. Um, people, uh, people have been saying that the government has been too slow to implement the changes to airport screening, that they should have been done right at the start. We should have had uh, robust tests and measures in place early. We could have caught it. NerveTag held a meeting in actually almost exactly a year ago um, that said that port of screening entry for those coming from Wuhan in China was not advised. That was despite four of the five cases detected outside of China being detected at airports. Uh, NerveTag meetings say that they deemed the measures to be inefficient. NerveTag agreed that providing information to travellers would be more effective. That was in the measure that we saw leaflets being handed out. Truth is, you haven't really changed your view on the inefficiencies of airport screening, have you? Well, that's really a question for the modelers, but the modelers have been advising us for some time that, that um, restricting um, airport, um, well, importation of the virus from overseas is, is, um, is pretty inefficient as a way of controlling disease unless you do it absolutely rigorously. I know that um, Neil Ferguson's group did some modeling back in 2009 with influenza where they showed that you had to get above 98% a reduction in international travel in mm. order to have a major effect because just a so the few government's people not, coming the government's in. N yeah, but the government's yeah. not following the science on this, are they? Well, the government has been steering a course between the science and what they think they need to do in order to um, in order to allow industry to continue to function. And that's a very hard course to, to follow. So why and are I think, they doing it then? If, know, it's, we, if it's ineffective, if the scientists are saying this isn't, listen, this isn't going to work, um, why do you think they mm. are doing it? I think they, there may be other agendas that need to, need to be followed. I would say that if we have sorry, uh, sorry, like people, like like what 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 are, what other agendas? Well, uh, not wishing to restrict um, travel, not wish, wishing to restrict people's freedom. You know, these are things that the politicians are very um, are very concerned. But the freedom about. was is there, it was actually it was actually freer before these restrictions were introduced because you didn't need to have a test seventy two hours before you came back into the country. Yes. Absolutely, I, I mean, it is it is of, of doubtful benefit according to the to, to what the modelers are saying. But as I say, this isn't my prime area of expertise. But we certainly have seen papers at NerveTag which would support the idea that this is not going to have a very large effect compared to um, better behaviour in terms of um, public compliance. Do you think they're a final one on this? Because I realise, as you say, not your area, but you're in the the group. Do you think they're doing it because? I think for the majority of people, common sense might suggest that it was a good idea to restrict people coming into the country or at least test people coming into the country so as not to seed the virus like last time. Well, there are certainly times when it is vital to test people and to restrict entry. And a lot of importation occurred from Spain um, during the summer when people were going on holiday to Spain. I think the time when it would have made a huge difference would have been when we had very, very low case numbers. And if we just carried on with some pretty strict measures during July, August, uh, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in now. We know that taking action early and sticking to, to, to those rules is the way to keep these outbreaks down. But at I the know, moment, I, I get not, that. Not I do really get that, that Professor. Situation. But, but I, yes. I, do, I understand that. But and nevertheless, it was your group that said a year ago that it wouldn't be effective to do this. So even, even at the very early stage of this pandemic, uh, when we were looking at cases of unexplained um, incidents in Wuhan, that your group was still saying it would be ineffective to do this. Isn't the question not whether it's effective or, uh, ineffective or not, but how to make it effective? I think you've got a very good point, Tom. I, I do think we need to take a, a broader view. And you know, there are diverse views within um, the, those who do these sort of predictions and modelling. Um, and there isn't always an absolutely strict consensus. But I do think that the modelling which has been done um, by the, by the modelling groups is, is generally been quite good at predicting what's going to happen. Um, but 
it isn't necessarily the case that the those who make decisions politically are always going to observe just the advice they're getting from the scientific groups. Very finally on the, uh, uh, for this morning, um, as the new and emerging Respiratory Virus Threats Advisory Group, I don't suppose you're scanning the horizon for anything else. I mean, I know this has been absolutely horrific, what we've all gone through, but there, do, do uh, allay our concern, there's nothing else on the horizon, is there? Well, at the moment, we're, we're pretty preoccupied with this one, but we do also consider other emerging agents and whether outbreaks of, say, avian flu or, other, or influenza viruses or other um, respiratory threats. We do, we do consider those, uh, but it's not a major part of the agenda because we have so much to consider yeah. in terms but of there's nothing else. But there's nothing else that you're sort of nudging each other about going, oh, God, here we go again. There's, there's appearing from somewhere else around the world, is there? Not at the moment. It's really the, the new variants that are appearing all over the world that are most concerning, I think. Yeah, well, we, we must talk about that another time. We've run out of time. Professor, thank you very much indeed. Professor Peter Openshaw, Professor of Experimental Medicine at Imperial College London, former president of the British Society for Immunology, a member of that important nerve tag group. 0345 973 my number. Come to your calls as well. We'll speak to Labour in just a few moments. Uh, Steve Reid, the Shadow Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government. Labour MP for Croydon North will join us after this. Tom Swarbrick here, 1048. Nick Ferrari at breakfast, LBC. Home Secretary Pretty Patel. Why are the nurseries still open, Home Secretary? These are safe environments. Explain to me how a nursery is a COVID secure premises, Home Secretary. They are COVID secure because the people that are running nurseries, they are not only um, practitioners in education, but they are following public health guidance on how to put in force coronavirus regulation. Nick Ferrari at breakfast, weekday mornings from 7, LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. We'll speak to Labour in just a moment. Let's come to your calls first. Dax is in Bushy in Hertfordshire. Hiya, Dax. Hello. How are you doing? Hi. Yeah, good. Your your thoughts on how this is being enforced? Yeah, I was listening this morning and some of the callers talking about the bending of the rules and sort of the restrictions being quite wishy-washy and open for interpretation. I own a dance studio in central London, just off the embankment. Um, it's quite a well-known studio within our sector. I know for a fact, obviously we're closed at the minute due to the national lockdown. I know for a fact two studios that are opening tomorrow, they're absolutely not allowed to, but they've they've kind of advertised that they've bent the rules. But obviously we know looking into the restrictions given to us mm. by uh, the government representative that it's absolutely not allowed whatsoever. And obviously a sector which is a dance studio of people that are doing what they do within a studio together, and um, is quite dangerous. It's not, it's not a case sure. of a, a tat tail kind of situation. It's, but, it's the but danger what is it of it gives, with the NHS. Yeah, totally. What, what is, and so well done you for having to you know, shut your doors and, and do the responsible thing. Presumably, though, Dax, if, if people know, if they're advertising that they're opening despite the, the rules being in place, they know they're going to get uh, the fine or whatever it's going to be, the thousand, thousands of pounds that people are fined for opening businesses that should be shut. I think you'd be surprised on, on how little it is reported. I think if you're talking about people um, meeting families or friends when, when you're in a street of neighbours, then people know the rules uh, of common sense. But when there's a sector saying we've been given the go-ahead from our council, um, it's especially when you're talking about a young demographic, we're talking about uh, dance as a subject, self-employed yeah. people that have been hit very hard at the minute. You've got to imagine, I guess, in entertainment, theatres have had the advertisement, but there's a lot of... Oh, totally. Oh, you can, uh, Dax, I completely appreciate people want to get their businesses open. Of course you do. You want to get back to work. You want to get people in through your doors. Of course you do. I just think if it's very clear in the government guidance that these places shouldn't be open and one can see why that they why they shouldn't be, then those businesses Absolutely. presumably must, must be expecting a fine to come their way, unless, of course, they think they can get away with it, which is another issue. Dax, thank you so much for your call. 0345 973 the number. Uh, 10.54 is the time. Steve Reid joins us. Shadow Secretary of State for Communities and Local government Labour MP for Croydon North. Thank you for being there for us this morning, Mr. Reid. Let's just pick up on that point about enforcement. Um, do you support the police in being a lot tougher with managing these restrictions than they have might than they may well otherwise have been? Well, I, I mean, I, you know, the, the, the police need to remain proportionate in their response to what's going on, and they, you know, they 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 will do as they have been doing, uh, apply common sense to uh, to these situations now i think where, where there's been a, a relatively minor breach then the best thing in my view for the police to do is just to engage with those people and explain what the rules uh, what the rules are where there's something a bit more flagrant then uh, there needs to be enforcement uh, including fines and where you get premises that are repeatedly breaching regulations uh, then i think there should be action to close them down and those were powers that were given to councils and yeah. local uh, local authorities during the course uh, of last year but but fundamentally this is about being proportionate all the way through but proportionate of course means something different in a situation where spreading this virus risks yeah. puts other people's lives in danger as an mp as a shadow cabinet minister are you um comfortable with just how much power the government has and with just how much power the police have i, I am in this situation a parliament uh, passed temporary legislation, uh, giving yeah. the government more, more power during the course of this pandemic. You know, one, one of the things that we've been criticising the government for is going too slow at many stages during this pandemic. What we can't have uh, is things where we're stopping uh, interventions that need to happen at pace in order to stop the spread of this virus. You know, just mm. look at the hospitals this weekend. Look at the headlines we're seeing in all the papers. Speak to people who are working in the hospitals. They are close to breaking point. They are starting to feel overwhelmed. Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, has declared a major incident because of the state of our hospitals. We simply cannot allow our hospitals to be mm. overwhelmed with COVID patients. So I think the police are right to act with a more urgency than they might have done in other circumstances. Uh, you talk about people being overwhelmed. Of course, financially, things are very, very difficult. Uh, I've seen that the government have suspended any um, any costs incurred by missing the tax deadline at the end of this month. Um, but council tax too has been an issue for people. Yeah, well, you know, we're councils have seen a big drop-off in the amount of council tax revenue coming through as people have lost their jobs. I think it's about 
a million people have lost their jobs since the pandemic began. Many others, of course, on the furlough scheme, millions of others on the furlough scheme. Now, the furlough scheme, even, even as extended, comes to an end on the 31st of March. And the government announced uh, the, other, the other day in the, in the House of Commons that they're expecting councils to raise council tax by 5% from the 1st of April. Now, when we're in the middle of the deepest recession for 300 years, we're suffering the biggest recession of any major, uh, any major economy. This is not the time to impose a 5% council tax rise on on people who are, you know, frankly, many people struggling, struggling to, to, to get. So by. councils so are going to have to bear the brunt of it. Councils are going to have to find it from somewhere. It's going to have to come from from central funds anyway, which comes out of taxation. So they'll be paying for it anyway. <laughs> Well, the, 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 the reason for the council tax increase is to fund social care, which, you know, of course, we all want social care properly funded. If you remember the day Boris Johnson became prime minister, he stood on the steps of Downing Street and said he had a plan to fix the crisis in social care. Now, mm -hmm. I presume that plan included a means to fund it. No one has seen dot or comma uh, of that plan ever since. He needs to bring it forward uh, now. We just can't keep taking care away from older and disabled people in the way that's happened over recent years. So we want the government to come up with a reasonable way to fund this. Council tax is actually a very inefficient way to do it because if you're in a richer area, 5% mm. raises more money than if you're in a poorer area but sure, surely all older people deserve the same standard of care yeah. wherever they are. So the government needs to come bring forward this plan. Where is it? We have promised it an awful long time ago and I think yeah. the country needs to see it now. Um, and just very finally, uh, I note that your leader, Sakir Starmer, has changed tack when it comes to arguing for reinstating UK EU free movement if he were Prime Minister. He had said, yes, he would bring it back or seek to argue for it and challenge for it. He, uh, he said this morning uh, that he doesn't think that reopening aspects of the treaty on those issues would be a good idea. Um, is, do, does Labour support freedom of movement? <laughs> Uh, we 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 don't now. We've uh, we've we've voted for the government's Brexit deal on the basis that although it's a very very thin deal, it was better than the catastrophe of a no deal Brexit for for the economy and businesses. We hope that if Labour wins the next election, that will mm. be the basis we'll inherit and that we will have to build on. But nobody is. It's going to upset a lot of your members, isn't it? Finally, it's going to upset a lot of your members that Labour now doesn't support freedom of movement. Well, the country, you know, in the, in the referendum, it was a 52-48 split. But there was a decision that that issue is now settled. Labour's not going to reopen it again. OK, good to talk to you, Steve Reid. Thank you very much indeed. You too, the Shadow Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government, Labour MP for Croydon North. After the news at 11 o'clock, I want to talk more about the vaccine rollout. We've heard now that two million people have had their jabs, which is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, you compare it globally and the UK is doing a fantastic job in getting needles into arms so that we can get jab our way out of this thing. You may have seen that yesterday, Her Majesty the Queen and His Royal Highness Prince Philip had the jab. They've had the first dose. We'll speak to the Joint Centre for Vaccines and Immunisation about who it is that is going to be prioritised in the second round of immunisations, whether teachers, medics, hospital staff could be bumped to the top of the queue so we can have some semblance of normality returned early, and indeed whether you think it is right to, to prolong the gap between the first and second doses that many people are now receiving. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 11 o'clock, regular rapid tests for people without coronavirus symptoms are being expanded across England from this week. The government's encouraging those who can't work from home to get priority. It's as England's chief medical officer, Chris Whitty, has warned the NHS faces the most dangerous situation in living memory following surging infection levels. Dr Claudia Paoloni is president of the Hospital Consultant Specialist Association. Speaking to Swarbrick on Sunday, she said unless people people start to follow the rules more strictly, emergency patients will have to be turned away from hospitals. The reality of what we have now is we have ambulances queuing up outside hospitals unable to unload their patients. If you can't unload your ambulance, you can't go to someone else. And therefore, you're not available for someone else who might need it for either COVID or non-COVID. NHS England says it's begun inviting people over the age of 80 to attend large coronavirus vaccination centres. The seven regional units will open in the coming days. So far, 130,000 letters have been received. 
The head of the Police Federation of England and Wales has told LBC officers need more clarity from ministers on lockdown rules. Police tactics have come under increased scrutiny after officers in Derbyshire fined two women on a walk in a nature reserve. John Apter has told Swarbrick on Sunday officers are under pressure to do the right thing in a constantly changing landscape. The issue is it's how it changes so rapidly and the guidance. There's a lot of confusion, certainly with the public, understandably, between what's the law and what's guidance. So let's use the example in Derbyshire. So this is about how far do you travel. That is not written down in law, it's in guidance. No. A 28-year-old woman has been arrested after two men died in East London. Police were called to reports of a disturbance at a house in Ilford early this morning. A taser was used during the arrest. And the U.S. Vice President Mike Pence has confirmed he will attend the inauguration of Joe Biden as U.S. President in 10 days' time. Donald Trump's already confirmed he won't. The Democrats say they'll start the impeachment process against Mr. Trump for a second time tomorrow to try to remove him from office. And the weather, freezing fog and low cloud may be slow to clear from southern areas this morning. Patchy cloud and some sunny spells in central parts. Showers further north. Highs of 7 degrees. From Global's Newsroom, I'm Dominic Ellis. is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Very good morning to you. Four minutes past 11 is the time you're listening to and possibly even watching Swarbrick on Sunday here on LBC. I'm Tom Swarbrick. I hope we find you very well and warm this incredibly cold January morning. Um, it's pretty bleak out there for all sorts of reasons. We've been talking about the fact that the police are going to have to get really tough on the breaking of the restrictions, uh, that the NHS is at its worst possible moment or, or under more pressure than it has ever been in its history, according to the Chief Medical Officer Chris Whitty, who once again is restating uh, that it is really the case that you need to stay at home if you do not have a good reason uh, to leave your home given the spread of the virus. However, help is at hand, what the Sunday Mirror is calling a shot in the marm. That Her Majesty the Queen has now had the COVID vaccine, uh, Prince Philip as well, they received the jab at Windsor. A source said they went public to prevent further speculation, presumably about whether or not they'd had it. Can you imagine being the person administ administering the jab? So Her Majesty the Queen, you better be on your game if you're going to be doing that. Uh, more than two million people have now received the vaccine, we're told, uh, as these centres gear up around the country to offer max mass vaccination to get as many people the jab as possible. Indeed, the Health Secretary is saying that every adult will be offered a vaccine by the autumn. We'll speak to a member of the Joint Committee on Vaccines and Immunisation in just a few moments. Let's get live first, though, to LBC's James Goodison, our reporter at London's Excel Centre. Morning to you, James. Good morning, Tom. Yes, the Nightingale was, of course, built during the first wave of the pandemic to help the NHS if it really went over capacity. They weren't used, mothballed for most of last year. But now it looks like the London one will be dusted off and ready for two reasons, though. One negative, one positive. The first is to deal with the capacity problems in London hospitals, really feeling the strain now of coronavirus as we go into the new year. But on a slightly brighter note, they will be administering vaccines here. It's very close to the DLR, very easy to get to. It's seen as one of the centres. Is there any sign that they're gearing up for an opening tomorrow? Not at the moment. The security staff that I've been speaking to say that when they actually will open it next week, they don't know. Keeping their cards very close to their chest, one person told me. There's a smattering of ambulances here. But finally, it looks like a chance that this 500-bed uh, emergency hospital that was built last year with the potential capacity of 4,000 beds will be joining the fight against coronavirus, both in treatment and in cure. Tom. And James, wh James, where else around the country can we see these, these centres starting to open? Because there are a couple more, aren't there? Yeah, they are absolutely a number up and down the country, notably at Birmingham as well with their Nightingale Hospital. Lots of different areas up and down the country uh, that will be uh, giving over the vaccine and uh, centres that 
will be open for members of the public as this continues to roll out. Of course, uh, we're slowly and surely seeing the different batches come in from Pfizer, Moderna, and of course the Oxford AstraZeneca one. Uh, so it really is going to start ramping up from now. All right, James Goodison, thank you. LBC's reporter at London's Excel Centre. Yes, the health secretary is saying that they're on course to reach the critical number of two million jabs a week, uh, which you'll see the top four tiers of people vaccinated, uh, hopefully, or at least got given one dose by the middle of February. Let's turn to Professor Jeremy Brown, Professor of Respiratory Infection at UCL, a member of the Joint Committee on Vaccines and Immunisation. Thank you very much indeed for joining the programme this morning, Professor. Uh, so every adult is to be offered a, a vaccine by the autumn. How is that going to happen? Uh, good morning, Tom. Morning. Well, I think we just carry on, essentially. The, the vaccination programme needs to ramp up and deliver 2 million vaccines a week, as suggested, and we'll just carry on doing that right through to the autumn. Uh, you uh, Are you um, happy, and we'll explore this in just a moment, but on the face of it right now as we speak this morning, you are satisfied that we are going to reach that deadline that the Prime Minister offered, that the rollout, that the vaccine numbers, the supply is there? I think it's a challenge, but I'm pretty confident that they will achieve it, given the fact that we have a well-established programme for winter vaccination for flu to build on. Uh, it's a question of supply and ramping up the actual delivery of that vaccination. And I, I advise on the JCVI, we advise on priority and sort of policy. Yeah. The actual delivery yeah. is, is not our remit, so I can't give you precise figures about no, that. No, I understand that. Um, let me put this to you then. There's a, an official in Number 10 is reported as saying in the papers today that the medics are telling the Prime Minister, quote, that younger and lower risk people shouldn't leave home until they have been vaccinated. Do you agree? Mm. OK, so, I mean... It, <laughs> The problem here is that the vaccines come a little late. We have our massive second wave, which is much worse than anybody thought it was going to be, I think. Uh, and I just spent the, the, the whole week of the New Year's weekend working on the, the wards on a, on a high dependency unit full of COVID patients at my hospital, UCH. And it is pretty horrendous in the hospitals at the moment. So the we do need to stop the spread of the virus because the hospital that i work in uch has, has an itu of 45 beds normally uh and now has an itu of about 100 beds plus three separate independent uh, separate high dependency units so it, that is a horrendously large increase in the number of people who are acutely sick so the need to stop the spread of the virus is really acute and I'm not quite sure. I, I don't quite know, Professor, whether that is a yes. I mean, it sounds from everything that you've said, you've you've framed it. You have framed it in a way that makes um, me come to the conclusion that your answer leans towards a yes. That yes. younger and lower risk people should not be leaving their home until they've been vaccinated, um, for fear that there's going to be additional pressure on those areas of the NHS that are already under massive pressure. No, we need to follow the regulations and the and the, the suggested uh, social isolation policy by the government. Yes, and that means you know not leaving home unless there's a good, very good reason to do so. But until they've been vaccinated, I mean that could yeah, be okay. that could so, be months and months. Yeah. Okay, so the the issue there is at what point can the 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 regulations be relaxed, and that's a difficult one because the first round of vaccinations, the first up until I mean the first four tiers, that will probably limit the mortality from people getting infected by about eighty percent. However. It doesn't stop people getting infected who are younger and they are ending up in hospital. So when I was on the ward last week, half my patients were below the age that would have received the vaccine in the sort of mm. the first few mm. weeks, those next couple of months. And that means that even if you can vaccinate people successfully down to the age of 70, there will still be a lot of people getting the infection and who will end up in hospital. Uh, beyond that point, and that will limit the ability of the government to release the social. But even with, even isolation. with eighty percent, as you say, if the if the top four are, uh, tiers are inoculated, even eighty percent of the problem is being managed there, mm -hmm. and yet still, there is a potential that the government might decide, and the scientists might advocate for, based on what you were saying, that younger and lower risk people are kept at home or asked to stay at home until they've received the jab. Yeah. Okay. So. When you say the problem is taken care of, 80% of the mortality is taken care of. That isn't 80% of the hospital 
use. No, sure. Okay. Well, 80% of the risk, because let's, let's, so, we're, yeah. we're locking down to protect the NHS. So 80% of the risk I, is dealt with. At that point, there's going to be a really, really difficult moment, Professor, that at the point at which everybody is vaccinated in that top group by middle of February, people like me, mid-30s, relatively healthy, at lower risk of this, are going to start saying, can we have our lives back now, please? Yes, and I think that's incredibly difficult. I, I And the point you're saying about somebody quoted saying you you can't you have to stay at home until you you've been vaccinated I, I think that isn't necessarily going to be tenable um but what you're talking about is what are very complicated political and economic questions that need to be addressed at a, a critical point when a large proportion of the, of the at-risk population have been vaccinated and really that isn't that is beyond the JCVI's remit because mm. it's much it's much more complex than uh, who should receive the vaccine. Yeah, so it might be medically sensible for that to happen, but of course there are there are clearly other considerations going on as well. Um, let's come back then to the stuff that is absolutely bang in your remit. Why is it that you you did change strategy uh, to give one dose to more people? Okay, so that, there are two reasons for that. One is that the data are very clear that one dose is pretty effective. Like uh, the for the Pfizer vaccine, you get the effectiveness, or about 90% of the effect of the Pfizer vaccine with one dose. Uh, and it's not too dissimilar for the, Austro, the, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So one dose is very effective. Two, clearly, we need to get as many vaccines into as many people as possible. We're not going to stop this pandemic in our country until we vaccinate, well, a very high portion of the country. And therefore, giving one dose to two people is a much better idea than giving two doses to one person, because you double the number of people you protect. Do, do you know what the proportion is, roughly, that the, you say it's very high that we need to have vaccinated in order to get this done? Do you know what proportion of the country that is? Uh, you're, you're, you're swaying back to the previous question, which is... <laughs> which is Just the, tell me when it's going to be over, Professor. <laughs> Just get us out yeah, of this. I know. And, uh, I mean, so, so that's not really a question I can answer in yeah. my position. Okay. But All right. Well, let, 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 me, let, let me ask you questions that you can answer then. So it, it, once we've got through the top four, um, there's a suggestion from one of your colleagues that teachers could be bumped up the priority list for vaccinations in a bid to, to, to get schools reopened. Um, do you think we could see that happen soon? I'm not entirely sure that's logical. Uh, the reason why the schools are closed is because of the transmission through the community being generated by the, the pupils. So if you vaccinate the teachers, you're not going to stop that. So um, I'm not entirely convinced that, that is what... But they could be in school to get schools open. I mean, this is your colleague, Professor Adam Finn. I'm sure you know yeah. him. He is off the Joint Committee on Vaccination. Yeah, he said that well. there would be... The, he said that a, a new list would begin to be discussed on Thursday. Uh, he said, absolutely, that's the next phase of the programme. JCVI will be discussing over the coming month phase, phase okay. two, if you like, of who will be prioritised next. Yeah, so th that, that, isn't, that is not a uh, contradiction what I'm saying. So what we're talking about there is the phase two of the vaccine program, which finishes off phase one. And phase one is down to age 50. So the, the first four tiers, which is down to age 70, is what's hoped to be completed by February mm. and February. And then we'll continue doing the rest of the phase one, which is down to the age of 50. And then we will need to start phase two, which is who needs to be vaccinated uh, in the next bunch, mm. and that will be trying to prevent hospital admissions, probably, and also targeting specific uh, so, occupations, and that will probably so, include teachers. Yes, or at least we okay. Need to so, you, you, so you would, who would you like to see at the top of that phase two list, then, Professor? Uh, okay, so now again, you're swaying, swaying the territory. I can't really discuss because we haven't discussed it in the meeting. It's going to be, I, I think, it's actually incredibly difficult choosing who should be. The highest priority for the phase one was relatively straightforward but phase two becomes much more complicated because it's it's a combination of different factors that need to be taken into account uh not just the health factors the hospital factors but also the economic the the sort of mm -hmm. how it affects um the resolution of our social isolation policies etc and it, it becomes incredibly complicated and but, and but teachers is, definitely are in the mix though oh uh, yes i mean it, it, teachers anybody who's a sort of public facing uh occupation or a job where you actually have to get out and about to actually do it then we need to consider their 
their prioritization within this phase two. Um, let me ask you about the end of all of this. Um, well, let me, first of all, let me come on to the, the vaccines themselves. Um, what's, the, what's the latest evidence on the mixing of vaccines, whether you could have Astra AstraZeneca plus a bit of Pfizer, plus a bit of Moderna or whatever, if you're struggling to get the second dose of the next one? Are you looking to see if that's a possibility? Those trials are being run. So people will be, uh, there are exper uh, you know, trials being done with one vaccine followed by a second vaccine. In theory, it, they largely depend on the same and same protein, the, the spike protein. It's just the carrier in the vaccine is different between the different vaccines. So in theory, they should be, you could mix between them. We're not planning to do that at the moment, but we'll get the data and see whether it's feasible because okay. from a pragmatic point of view, it might be necessary. So it might be not only necessary, but it might be possible as well. That's good news. Um, have there been experiments done or alterations made to the vaccine to take into account any of the new variants? So you've sort of got something ready on a shelf in case, you know, a 28th new variant appears that, that you think the vaccine could knock on the head. Yeah, OK. So actually, you, you, in your question, you give the answer to self because you said the 28th new version. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it is quite... It's. Technically, I think relatively straightforward to make a new vaccine to counter a new variant. The question is which new variant do you need yeah. to count, uh, whether it's the 27th or the 28th or the 41st. Yeah, that's the problem. So, um, and you can make the new vaccine relatively straightforward, but then to do the testing and get the regulatory approval, et cetera, is a bit more, that mm. takes time. Uh, and so you need to do that for the right new vaccine. And we're not at the point where we know where we are with that. And and do you think um, that once the number of people that need to be reached have been reached, once everybody's been offered it by the autumn, do you think the same people who have been vaccinated this time around will need to be vaccinated again at some stage in the future? And is there any understanding of what stage in the future we're going to need to roll this out again? OK, so that's about duration of protection, which at the moment we have no really good data for because simply people haven't been vaccinated for a long enough period. You need to see how they how their immune response is 12 months later down the line, 18 months, 24 months. And so at the moment, Tom, I'm afraid we are in a... Uh, we can't say anything sensible about that because we just don't have the data. But obviously, we look... That is, you know, <laughs> that's next on the list after the uh, second <laughs> phase. <laughs> it's yeah, no, I, I get it. When we have to yeah. revaccinate. <laughs> Yeah. But the truth, I mean, the truth is, the, the truth is that people are going to have to be revaccinated at some stage, whether it's six months, a year, or five years. Well, I you say that. Uh, I mean, you probably, I think it's likely to be the case. In theory, it is possible that if you vaccinate enough people, the virus will become non-endemic and be eradicated or disappear. Uh, I don't think that's likely, especially as the rest of the world will not be vaccinated. So, you know, there'll be continual exposure from uh, people coming to the country. Uh, and in some vaccines, they do give you lifelong protection or pretty much lifelong protection. So it is possible that one vaccine would be enough. Um, we just, I, I guess, I don't want to say that it is likely because I don't think it's that likely, but it's possible. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a call. We need to see. I, uh, Professor, I cannot wait to have you back on the programme to announce the news that this one jab does give you lifelong protection at some oh, stage. Yeah, I mean, You've been great, that would be, wouldn't it? But it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's possible, but um, yeah, yeah I, mean, I think <laughs> I, I'm mapping out my year here. So the, this part, we're going to work out who we're going to vaccinate for the second phase. And then later in the year, in the middle part of the year, we'll work out whether the vaccine works long enough for us to delay for a year or two or what, whatever period of time. You've been very, very generous with your time this morning and very patient with my questioning. Professor, thank you very much indeed. Professor Jeremy Brown, who is Professor of Respiratory Infection at UCH and a member of the Joint Committee on Vaccines and Immunisation. 03456060973 is my number. I want to talk more about how this is being rolled out. And by the way, if you uh, have been caught up in any of this, if it's touched your life in any way, maybe you've been jabbed or taken someone to a centre to, to get it jabbed, maybe you've, you've helped to try and build some of these centres that are um, popping up around the country. How are you seeing this vaccine by, being rolled out? Is it working well. 0345 6060 Your call's after this. It's 1121. This is LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060973. And just by way of rubbing it in, uh, it's popped up in my feed again, this news that New Zealand has now lifted all COVID restrictions, declaring the nation virus-free. One day, people, one day. We'll speak to Dr Richard Vautry, uh, Chairman of the British Medical Association's GP Committee, in just a sec. I want to get to David in Enfield, though, this morning. Hi, David. Uh, Good morning, Tom. Tom, you failed to question that last guest about the uh, efficacy of the um, Pfizer vaccine because the clinical trials... And this has been confirmed by the uh, New England uh, Journal of Medicine and also by the British Medical Association. It's based on two two injections, the first and then a second after 21 days. The first gives 52% coverage and the second boosts it to 95%. And no, that's been all over the press this week. It was reported in the Financial Times in the mail yesterday and nobody's discussed it today. Well, David, here you are on the radio discussing it. I mean, I, I, yes, I think I mean, that the, the fact that I, they have, as I mentioned, that they changed strategy earlier, uh, t- well, it was last week, wasn't it, two weeks ago, to give people the first dose, more people the first dose and ask people to wait a bit longer for the second one, was a clear change in policy. Yes, but, but, but there's, no, there's no clinical justification for it. That's what I'm saying. Look, but, fact, but David, the justification was... for it, as you heard, because I, I asked our guest, um, the justification for it is we need to give as many people some form of protection, even if it's not 95% protection, we need to give people some form of protection uh, so that they can, so that we can k- uh, keep the, the strain on, on the NHS as low as possible. Well, that's fine, Tom, as long as you tell them very clearly up front that they're only going to get a 52% protection, they've still got a 50% chance of getting the virus because it was reported yesterday a nurse who was given the, the uh, vaccine three weeks ago developed COVID. Mm. Well, that and th- David, that is why they say, uh, you're absolutely right to point this out, sir, absolutely right to point this out, that is why they say that unfortunately, even if you've had one dose, you still have to abide by the restrictions precisely because, as you say, it doesn't confer whole immunity. And as the as our guest was saying, they're not sure for how long that immunity is conferred for anyway. David, listen, thank you. 0345 6060 is the number. Again, if, if you've come into contact with the vaccination rollout, I would love to hear from you from your perspective about how it is going. Uh, on that note, let us turn to Dr. Richard Vautry, Chairman of the British Medical Association's GP Committee. Thank you for being there for us this morning, Dr. Vautry. Um, GPs frustrated, I read, at the speed with which they are receiving the vaccines. Can you tell us a bit more? Good morning. Oh, yes, GPs and uh, practice nurses and many others in our practice teams have worked incredibly hard to deliver over a million vaccines uh, in such short time, and particularly with the challenging nature uh, of the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, but we want more. Um, and we want to be able to protect our patients as quickly as possible. Uh, It's purely dependent on the supply of vaccine as to how quick we can vaccinate. Um, And there are many, many practices uh, who want to vaccinate almost on a daily basis, uh, but simply don't have sufficient vaccine to be able to do that. We know that there's manufacturing uh, processes that need to be uh, adhered to, logistical challenges, uh, but we need to work as hard as possible on that because practices want to protect their patients as quickly as possible. When we talk about the manufacture of it, or the, at least the delivery of it, can we be clear about, are, are, are you being told that the reason you're not getting it is because they just can't, you know, AstraZeneca just can't turn the stuff out quickly enough, or, you know, whatever it is, they just can't get it out of the lab quick enough? Or is it that once it's got out, it's stuck in a process somewhere to mean that it's not coming to the GP surgery? Where, where is the problem in the chain, do you think? Uh, We don't fully fully know. Uh, We know that vaccine production um, and delivery is a challenging uh, task. Uh, We see that every year. It's not unusual sort of um, each year to have delays in flu vaccine delivery. And that's a manufacturing process that's well established. You know, this is a new vaccine. Um, It's now sort of, you know, being wanted right across the world. Uh, We want to ensure this is produced as quickly as possible. We know that there are challenges doing that. Uh, But we need to recognise that the rate limiting factor at the moment uh, is not the willingness of NHS or general practice services uh, to give the vaccine. It's the availability of the vaccine itself. 
as soon I as we it, get I, it, we will give it to our patients. I, I get that. I do. I just think it is remarkable that either you're not being told, or, or you guys don't know as GPs administering this, where the problem actually exists in the in the uh, the chain to get it to you, so that we can find a way of ironing that out. Because as you say, everybody wants this over with as quickly as possible. Um, I've, there's videos circling around social media at the moment of very long queues in the cold for elderly people who have been hiding in homes since March outside GP surgeries. Do you have enough staff? Do you have enough space in GP surgeries? And how useful are these mass vaccination centres then therefore going to be? Uh, yes, we, we do have enough staff at the moment. Um, clearly, we'd always welcome. Uh, we know it's challenging, particularly with social distancing, uh, to keep our patients safe, because the last thing we want is someone who comes for a vaccination to actually pick up COVID whilst they're waiting for 15 minutes after that vaccination uh, during that observation and people period. are saying that's happened. I mean, there, there are people on Twitter who have been um, tweeting me over the course of the weekend saying their mum went to go and get the vaccine and unfortunately picked it up in a, perhaps in a queue somewhere. I think there's always a risk when any um, group of people meet together, so particularly when the virus is spreading so prevalently at the moment, um, that there is a risk sort of, you know, of, of people sort of infecting one another. We are doing our level best to limit that as much as possible. That's why people um, are standing outside and waiting outside until it's safe uh, to enter into the health healthcare facility um, or the surgery. Uh, and we're doing our level best to ensure that people get a timely appointment and we stick to that time. Uh, the clinic I was at yesterday, uh, there was no queue outside. So people were moving very rapidly through the center. It was very efficient. And that's the vast majority mm. of cases uh, where surgeries are able to do that. We do this every year with flu vaccine, but the real challenge at the moment is the social distancing so that's required. Yeah. So that does slow the process down. Finally, Mr. Vautry, uh, Dr. Vautry, do you, what more can you tell us about some scams that I've seen associated with the rollout of the vaccine? People getting texts from, uh, apparently from the NHS saying, right, well, thank you very much. You're going to get the vaccine. We need to register you. Can you provide us with your bank details and things like that, which is obviously a scam. Yeah, p please do not respond to anything like that at all. Uh, if your GP practice rings you up, they will be very clearly from your GP practice. Uh, they will invite you to an appropriate appointment. Please don't contact us until we contact you. Uh, but don't respond to any of these scams. So that's clearly um, you know, what they are. Um, and we must protect particularly our most vulnerable patients from this situation. Uh, and very, very finally, are you seeing a drop off in the number of routine calls that the GPs are getting, not least because GPs were advised, I think, in the week to suspend some routine services? Uh, we're not seeing that at the moment. Uh, we are trying our best to maintain some other services as well, particularly urgent care services. We'll always be there for our patients, uh, whether it's COVID related, vaccine related, or indeed uh, related to winter pressures of our long term conditions. Uh, we will want to reduce some of our uh, bureaucracy and red tape, our audits and, and other things that can be postponed uh, for the next few months. We'll do that, uh, but we'll always be there for our patients. Keep going. Dr. Richard Vautry, thank you very much indeed. You're the chairman of the British Medical Association's GP Committee. 0345 6060973 is my number. I'll get more in a few moments on the crucial process. And I know it's in the weeds. I know it's a Sunday morning and we don't want to talk about process. But my God, if there is anything to get our teeth into, it is how this vaccine is being delivered, where the problems are in the supply chain, so it can be ironed out so we can get this thing over and done with. Tom Swarbrick on LBC. We'll get some answers to that in just a minute, by the way. Tom Swarbrick on LBC, 11.32. Here's your news headlines, Dominic Ellis. The former president of the British Society for Immunology has told LBC the public have a major role to play in bringing surging coronavirus infection levels down. Professor Peter Openshaw says it's unrealistic to expect officers to be able to police every breach of lockdown rules. The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, says the UK is on course to hit its target of vaccinating 2 million people a week against COVID-19. NHS England says it's begun inviting people over the age of 80 to attend coronavirus vaccination centres. And the Shadow Secretary of State for Communities has told us the Chancellor needs to scrap plans to raise council taxes in the spring to protect families hit by the pandemic. Local authorities in England will be able to raise council tax by 5% from April, with 3% used to top up adult social care budgets. And the weather, freezing fog and low cloud may be slow to clear this morning in southern areas, patchy cloud and some sunshine in central parts. Highs of 7 degrees. This is LBC. P
This is LBC Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick. Live from Westminster. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. At the Downing Street press conference on the morning to you, by the way, Swarbrick on Sunday, LBC, you know the you know the deal. At the Downing Street press conference on on Thursday evening, a man was standing next to the Prime Minister called Brigadier Phil Prosser. Brigadier Phil Prosser is a new uh, uh, guest at these um, at these press conferences. He's the guy in the armed forces responsible for helping to get the vaccine out and about around the country, making the process as smooth as possible. He is the guy who, if he does his job incredibly well, we could start to see the end of this damn pandemic and start to get our lives back. And yet I was honestly absolutely amazed. Not a single person asked a question of Brigadier Phil Prosser in charge of this process. No one asked him about where the pinch points were or what difficulties they were having or any of the detail about the actually getting the vaccine out of the manufacturer's hands and into the arms of the people that need it. Not a single question. And yet, if you look into what you can find anyway, if you can find it publicly, the the process that is taking place as we speak right now to get the vaccine around the place, from a layperson's point of view, it's worrying, I think, particularly for the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which is filled and finished at one factory in Wrexham. One factory in Wrexham is in charge with filling and finishing the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine that is there in, hundred, in, in millions and millions of doses to try and get us out of this pandemic. And it relies on one factory. So I want to get as much detail as possible about how it gets into people, people's arms. Sandra Gidley joins me, president of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society and English Pharmacy Board member. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, Sandra. Um, just on this, I'm obsessed with this factory in Wrexham. Can you tell us any more about it, what your understanding of it is? Well, you've um, just described the situation, really. it's I'm not a vaccines expert, I uh, will say that, but it's uh, fill and finish, and a lot of the vaccine is manufactured abroad. Um, but don't forget, these days, most pharmaceuticals are a global supply chain. Um, you only need one hiccup in the process, one batch to fail, and that has a knock-on effect. So it is really, really difficult, and we do need to build in more resilience into um, both pharmaceuticals and vaccines. And one of the um, good things I think the government did was set up the Vaccines Task Force, which has actually acknowledged um, that there is a lack of capacity, um, but you can't produce it overnight. You, and um, I've looked into this. I, I initially thought, well, if you can uh, build a Nightingale hospital, what's so difficult? But apparently um, by the end of the year, there'll be another facility um, in Braintree, in Essex. Yeah, but it, 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 it takes that long. It's specialist equipment and um, it, it, apparently it can't just be knocked up over, overnight. You may want to get a vaccines expert, um, somebody from the vaccines task force to speak to you. Yeah. But, um, that's a frustration. And we've also got to remember as well that in, here in the UK, we're not the only customers for this. Um, mm. There are people all around the world. Europe, Europe um, is vaccinating less than us. So actually, we've got off to a good start with the procurement. Yeah. And I know it is frustrating for frontline um, health workers. I talk to pharmacists who are um, working in hospitals, delivering vaccines and in some of the with the GPs. And I know it's very frustrating when um, they get very short short notice that their next batch has uh, been delayed. And, and, and that may be because of uh, either difficulties of get bringing it into the country from those who are literally making it, or indeed getting it through the country, through the process and into the GP surgery, which may well, I don't know, involve this, this single factory in Wrexham, which clearly, Sandra, you are concerned about. Well, yes. I mean, we would, we all acknowledge that there should be more um, capacity, but unfortunately, um, it's a sign of lack of investment by uh, previous governments of all political colours that this has not been seen as um, a priority. We've all predicted um, that there could be some sort of pandemic related to MERS or SARS or uh, coronavirus, um, but the money wasn't put into research and the money wasn't put into infrastructure and bear in mind the limited infrastructure we have also has to produce the flu vaccine every year so so really we do need to step it up but unfortunately um i was a politician once and i understand the nature of political priorities um politicians react to what the public say they want so if you ask the public 
two years ago, whether they would rather see investment in cancer services or um, research into a, a, a vaccine, the answer would have been cancer. Now the answer would be very different. Um, so if I were to put, you were a Lib Dem MP, I think, for, for those of you who, people listening who weren't aware. Um, so if I, if I were to go down to my local pharmacy, would I be able to get a vaccine? No, and this is a frustration because um, I still work as a community pharmacist and the phone is ringing um, with people saying, have you got the vaccine? Can I buy it? Now it's queue jumping, so <laughs> please don't. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, can I have my vaccine with you? I've had my flu vaccine with you. And the problem here is um, the government tell us that they did plan to use community pharmacies um, once they've got everything else sorted out, which seems to me slightly short-sighted uh, thinking because rather than a sequential approach, um, a community pharmacy vaccine service could have been developed in tandem. And that is frustrating because actually you've got a trained army of vaccinators um, on the high street who could help with this problem. There's a single booking system. It's not beyond the realms of possibility. Now we know that there's not the 15 minute observation time after the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, that makes things easier. So please mm. use us. We can also, if we also allow um, pharmacy technicians who are registered health professionals to be trained as vaccinators, that also helps us with capacity. And every little helps. Why would you not be using every yeah, weapon quite. in your armory? Well, well Although if they're struggling to get vaccine vials to <laughs> GP <laughs> surgery, you can see why they're struggling to get them to pharmacies. Sandra, thank you so much for your time. Sandra Gidley, you. President of the Royal Pharmaceutical Society and English Pharmacy Board member, as she alluded to, once an MP. Uh, Russell's a new caller in South End this morning. Hi there, Russell. Hello, Tom. How are you? All right? I'm good, sir. Yeah, I'm very well. You want to talk about the rules, I think. Well, the rules, the first thing is I'm really, really delighted that we're going to get the rapid testing coming out to key workers. People are out and about every day. Um, I think that's a real good, you know, it's going to help in the long run. Um, the actual pinging app from the NHS has been totally a waste of time. I mean, we're getting, in a big industry that I'm in, I mean, I'm working with 300 colleagues. We've worked since March. People. What do you do, workers, Russell? Uh, I work for the Post, a uh, Royal Mail. Yeah. Royal Mail. And what we get is that people before Christmas who sadly got tested positive... Um, we're not getting our pinging on the app to tell us to isolate till about eight or nine days later, mm. and then they tell us to isolate for one day. So, no. Yes, You've been told to isolate on, for one day? We've had less than one eight. We've had one down to eight hours, Tom. We've had no, told to, you haven't. To actually, we You're have, joking. And, it's, and if you can, if you look into a... Because we can tell this, because everybody gets pinged, Everybody gets pinged in a certain area where the person was working, they got tested positive, and then what happens is they've all been told between one got tested the other day, uh, pinged the other day for one day, had to go off for one day, and then come back the next day. So yeah, that yeah, doesn't seem to be particularly useful, does it? And actually, given no. the number of cases there are, how many people have got this thing, one in 20 in parts of London, um, it's just, it's swamped, isn't it? It can't deal with the workload. Exactly, Tom. And I, I, I totally agree with you, and I'm not blaming. It's not. Our, it's not the actual work problem. It's the actual. It's the app that's failing. So it's a total waste of time, really. But the thing is, is that I do believe that the rapid testing is a good thing for us, so we can be tested to check that we are negative. But even mm. a better thing is to vaccinate the key workers that are actually well, out doing the job. Do you know, Russell? I, I. I... I took it as a sort of hint, an implied hint from our um, uh, guest from the Joint Centre for Vaccination and Immunisation that as part of the phase two of the vaccine rollout, it would be key workers, those people like yourself who go to work every day, um, who are going to be part of that phase two rollout of the vaccines. Now that might change, you didn't nail it on the mm. head, but I just got the impression that that's where we're heading. And it feels like that's the right place to be, isn't it? Well, Tom, I'll be honest with you, I'm 60 years old, I've just got my free flu jab, which were, you know, I... I fists in the air when I managed to get a free flu jab, you know, and I went down the doctors, had it done. But you know what, Tom? I've never been so scared in my whole life since March. Oh, I'm sorry. About, you know, it's, you're deli we've been told that things are on, it, it stays on letters, it stays on parcels, it stays on this, it stays on that. We're actually taking COVID tests out of post boxes to actually send off, that people are actually putting them into, po their tests are actually going into post boxes. Mm-hmm. 
and we have to empty the post boxes out. We we put them in polythene bags. We take them. They get done right. We get them put polythene bags going off to where they should go. But I mean, every day we're we're dealing with different things that, and we're hearing from Sage, from Nerve Tag. We hear all these different things that are going on. That even tele doctors, they're all sort of arguing with each other. I don't want to listen to news now. I don't want to listen to. Uh, professors Chris Whitty and all that because it absolutely scares us because we've got top scientists top people arguing with each other Mm. about different Well listen Russell I I, I absolutely take my hat off to you and your colleagues I think again you're part of a group of people who are frankly uh, unsung heroes throughout all of this and I'm not surprised you're terrified um, everything that we have heard from from the medics and from from everybody else, from the politicians, is that this is at a particularly scary point right now. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon saying the other day that at no point since this first started has she been as worried as she currently is about it. And so if you have to go into work, if you can't work from home, uh, it is really, really difficult and very, very worrying. So, Russell, I absolutely take my hat off to you. And, of course, I do, that is partly why, of course, it is people like yourself, sir, who have to go into work, who should be next on the list uh, for people getting the jab when it comes through. Thank you very much for what you do. Mind how you go. 0345 is my number. More calls in just a moment. 11.48. Nick Ferrari at breakfast, LBC. Why, for the love of God, the journalists who took part in that press conference, there in front of them is Brigadier Phil Prosser, the man who is responsible for ensuring that the jabs get in your arms, the arms of your granny, your granddad, your loved ones. And to whom did they focus all of their questions? Yes, that's right, to the Prime Minister, who they've had countless times saying, when will this all end? Did you think the Prime Minister was going to say, it's March the 17th? It's a virus. Nobody knows. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. First, weekday mornings from 7, LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Morning to you. We've been talking about the um, additional authority with which the police are now policing this lockdown, handing out fines much more quickly. They've been told to go through the gears um, to get to fining people quite quickly uh, who are, in their view, breaking the law. Um, to the point where we saw these uh, two ladies in Derbyshire who went out for a socially distanced walk. They went out some five miles from their home to this area where they were having their nice little walk and they were there with a thermos of tea each. Uh, that was deemed to be a pick which is not allowed under the new regulations and therefore the two ladies were fined. Derbyshire Police is reviewing it. After the news at midday, we will speak to one of the two ladies who was fined as a result of going out for this apparent picnic about her side of the story in all of this. That's coming up after the news at 12. Meanwhile, Catherine's in Cobham in Surrey. Hi there, Catherine. Hello, I'm in Chobham, not Cobham. But Oh, I beg your pardon. It's that, it's that blessed H again. It is. There you go. Um, I just rang in to say that my 84-year-old husband got a letter yesterday. And so, as instructed in the letter, we rang 119. And after about two and a quarter hours, we got through, gave all the details. And they said, the nearest centre we can offer you is the Excel Centre in London. So I thought that maybe the lady had misheard our postcode. And she said, no, that's correct. Um, there are only five centres on our system. And I said, but we've got a centre three and a half miles away to which all our friends and neighbours are going. And she said, I'm sorry, I can't access that. So I said, you want two old people to go into the centre of London where one in 20 are infected? I said, firstly, we can't possibly get there. Um, she said, well, have a look online. So we went online and we were offered Birmingham which is 100 miles away. What? And then we were offered Bristol, then the Excel Centre, and then eventually Epsom Racecourse, if um, we felt like driving down the M25. So I went on to the Epsom Racecourse site this morning again, and we can go at 8am or late afternoon. Um, but in fact, it, you know, we can't actually get there. So our surgery aren't doing vaccinations and we've been told not to ring the surgery so we don't know what to do or how to get vaccinated and when's he booked in for or when was he told that he was getting a vaccine um he we got the letter yesterday in order to make the appointment of oh, catherine there is so much in <laughs> in your story that i find absolutely staggering not least that you waited for two and a quarter hours on the phone to get through to someone to be told to you know, that you'd have to travel a long way into an area where there is a very, very high prevalence mm, of the virus mm. to have it. It seems... Uh, do, do you have a local pharmacy? We have a local pharmacy, yes. So that would be the place, as I was speaking to, the, uh, to my last guest, where it would strike me that it would be most sensible for you to go to have it. Yes, but how do you get the appointment? Because well, at our, our local centre in Woking, as I say, which is sort of literally down the road, how does one access it? So right now, despite having received the letter, mm. um, it doesn't sound like your husband's going to be getting the vaccine anytime soon if that it can't be correct. brought closer to him. That is absolutely correct. And we don't know what to do next. I mean, it's not often that I'm stumped, but I just don't know how to take this a stage further. Because, I mean, I'm not going to, you know, we're not going to the Excel Centre. No. <laughs> do you know, Catherine, I... I, I um, I don't know what I can say to you, to be honest, because I don't know either. I don't know what you, who, who you have recourse to speak to next if you're being told, well, you can go here, there and everywhere. You're saying you can't get to them and actually, is it really sensible for, for two people to come into London um, who are clearly so vulnerable to this thing? I, I don't... I, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I just don't... I mean, that is astonishing. But also, I mean, I don't think it's sensible, even if we went to um, the one that they suggested... Do they really want people driving miles and miles and miles when we're told not to go far from home? We've been meticulous about keeping to the rules and not going out and this, and the other. Mm. Um, so we're not desperately keen to go to go into uh, somewhere that we know is well, highly you know what, infected. But the idea that this is a wonderful new program and everybody's going to get vaccinated, I thought it would be interesting for you to know that it isn't actually quite like that yet. Well, it, uh, do you know what? If it's all right with you, what I'll get 
get you to do is if it's all right is just hold on the line for a couple of minutes mm -hmm. um, and my colleagues might take your number if that's okay with you because I'd like to keep in touch with you over the course of the next few days um, on my on my show uh, Mondays to Thursdays at 10 p.m. because I'll keep in touch with you Catherine and see how you're getting on with you and your husband to okay. see what else can be done to try and help you out because it's it, that's that's not going to work is it thus far it seems very lack, common lacking in common sense so far and you can't really be left without any chance of getting the vaccine for for much longer Catherine thank you stay on the line I'll get one of the team to talk to you Nick's in Holland Park hi there Nick uh, hello um I'm notwithstanding the very nice lady from Chobham who you just spoke to I'm heartily tired of elderly people complaining about not getting their second jab why well um, scientists, and in fact, I heard this on LBC radio, said that um, first they misunderstand the the efficacy of the of the vaccine. The vaccine doesn't stop you getting the virus. The virus enters your body anyway. What it does is stop you getting ill. And right. the first vaccine, the first jab, doesn't. It just reduces the likelihood Correct. of you get uh, of you getting. Uh, sorry, it 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 it's not quite as effective at stopping you get very ill as the double jab. But a, according to the scientist on your program last week, and not your program, your station, station. that's Good ninety station. percent effective at stopping you going to hospital, and that's the key thing. You know, frankly, if there are millions of people having ill and nasty flu symptoms at home, who cares? That's not the crisis. The crisis is the pinch point no, I agree. of hospitalizations Nick, Nick. in the NHS. And Nick. may I say, my mother stole a second jab the day before yesterday. I took her for, for her first vaccine. She's 89. I took her for her first jab two and a half weeks ago. The um, I, I was phoned because they had my mobile number during last week to say your mother's appointment's been cancelled. It's at the end of February. My mother refused to believe it and was worried about her own health and went down to the vaccination centre anyway where she'd been before and basically persuaded and inveigled her way into getting a second jab. I mean, frankly, the NHS should have sent her away. I wouldn't take her down because I said she was just postponing the end of the lockdown wow. for, for no rational reason. So she, also, she, 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 argued, she argued her way to a second jab, Nick? Inveigled is the, way, the word I'd use, yes, exactly. Right. And, and, and she just didn't, well, she, no, she actually understood the concept. I'd even told her why she shouldn't go and get the second jab because mm. every person that takes the second jab is effectively, in my view, postponing, I think the government's come to this, realization postponing the end of any reasonable lot the lot well i think well nick that is what you have described is why the government or the jcvi changed position um they changed position from from as you know from trying to give people two doses with that gap in between to just getting the doses out as fast as possible because the reason why we're locking down is in order to protect the nhs the more we do to protect the nhs by by stopping people um, you know, biologically, they but their immune system is able to cope with it, so they don't need hospital. That then means that we might be able to get out of this lockdown quickly. Nick, thank you very much indeed. After the news at twelve, we'll speak to one of the women caught by police in Derbyshire, who will give us her side of the story. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC, leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at midday, the Health Secretary Matt Hancock says the UK is on course to hit its target of vaccinating 2 million people a week against coronavirus. NHS England says it's begun inviting people over the age of 80 to attend COVID-19 vaccination centres. So far, 130,000 letters have been received. Jeremy Browns, a professor of respiratory infection at University College London and a member of the Joint Committee on Vaccines and Immunisation. Speaking to Swarbrick on Sunday, he says the NHS has the infrastructure and capacity to hit the target. I think it's a challenge, but I'm pretty confident that they will achieve it, given the fact that we have a well-established programme for winter vaccination for flu to build on. It's a question of supply and ramping up the actual delivery of that vaccination. The Home Secretary has defended the way police have handed out fines for lockdown breaches, warning that officers will not hesitate to take action. Pretty Patel says the increasing number of new COVID-19 cases demonstrates there's a need for strong enforcement. 
The former president of the British Society for Immunology has told LBC the public have a major role to play in bringing surging coronavirus infection levels down. This is England's chief medical officer, Professor Chris Whitty, has warned the NHS faces the most dangerous situation in living memory. Professor Peter Openshaw is also a member of the government's advisory group for new and emerging respiratory viruses. He's told Swarbrick on Sunday, people have to adhere to the rules to ensure the situation doesn't become irreversible. It's not a trade-off between we can allow some deaths in order to open up commerce. If you look internationally, you can see that the countries that actually did take lockdown seriously and drove numbers right, right down are the countries which are now doing very well economically. You know, China and Vietnam, yes. they've done really well because they got numbers right down. The Shadow Secretary of State for Communities has urged the Chancellor to protect families hit by the pandemic and scrap plans to raise council taxes this spring. Local authorities in England will be able to raise council tax by 5% from April, with 3% used to top up adult social care budgets. But speaking to Swarbrick on Sunday, Steve Reid says the move could push families into crisis. Now, when we're in the middle of the deepest recession for 300 years, we're suffering the biggest recession of any major uh, any major economy. This is not the time to impose a 5% council tax rise on on people who are, you know, frankly, many people struggling, struggling to, to, to get so by. And officials in France have recommended European rugby union games against British clubs are put on hold in the pandemic. It says it wants short-term measures to stop upcoming matches going ahead, while COVID cases are high. And the weather, some freezing fog and low cloud lingering in southern areas as we go into the afternoon. Patchy cloud and some sunshine in central parts. Cloudy at further north with showers. Highs of 7 degrees. From Global's Newsroom, I'm Dominic Ellis. is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Very good afternoon to you. Five minutes past 12 is the time. Swarbrick on Sunday here this Sunday afternoon on LBC. Hope we find you incredibly well. Um, Chris Whitty it is who has given the starkest of the warnings thus far about the state of the NHS right now. He is saying that it has experienced a crisis unlike any other at any stage of its history. I think the uh, quote that is in the Sunday Telegraph this morning about people following the lockdown restrictions, because Chris Whitty's um, suggestion is that we really do need to stay at home, we really need to follow these restrictions in order to lift the pressure on the NHS. There's a quote here in the Sunday Telegraph from a Home Office insider who's saying that police officers would be quicker to find people, uh, warning, quote, we are going to see more rapid movement to enforce. Over a thousand people died yesterday. It is important that everyone sticks to the rules. If there was a gunman who killed a thousand people running around the country and the government said stay at home, everyone would say, OK, I'll do that. I won't go for a coffee with some friends and walk around the park, is the quote from the Home Office Insider. Come on to your calls in a few moments' time about how the police are enforcing this, whether they are enforcing it fairly, or whether any, any sort of idea that they are doing it unfairly or overzealously is going to have an impact on trust in the police, and indeed whether you'll follow the restrictions at all. The specific nature of the idea of people going for a coffee with some friends around the park, I think actually refers to an incident that took place uh, in Derbyshire. Two ladies, Jessica and Eliza, they were walking at a reservoir five miles from their home when they were then stopped by police officers and fined £200 each. I'm delighted to say that Jessica Allen, one of the two people stopped by Derbyshire police and fined 200 quid, joins me on the programme. Thank you for being there for us this morning, Jessica. Um, Thanks for inviting me. No, you're more than welcome. Tell us what happened. Start from the beginning. Okay, so um, Eliza and I, we'd planned to go on a socially distanced walk on Wednesday. Um, we live in Ashby de la Zouche, which is a busy market town. Um, and we're regular visitors to um, Four Mark Reservoir. I've got a Labrador. It's a lovely place to go where you really don't see anybody. Um I was on my way home and I, I care for my nana. She she lives by herself. So I'd just taken her shopping to her. I'd noticed that the, the streets throughout the, the town centre were really busy. So I said to Eliza, you know, 
do you want to walk through the town or shall we go to Formark? Where we decided, let's go to Formark. We felt that it would be a much quieter place to go to. And that's um, five miles from your home. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, just a short short drive. And as I said, you know, we're regular visitors. It isn't somewhere yeah. where, you know, it's a special occasion to, to drive so far. Um, it was a cold day. We decided let's, dra- let's grab a um, drive-through hot drink, um, which seemed a sensible thing to do. You know, these places are open, so you are allowed to use them. And uh, as we arrived to the reservoir, we're greeted by a police van and police car with several policemen and women stood around and at first I think you know gosh is something really serious happened you know this place is normally deserted I thought you know has there been a freak accident has you know there been a body found it it was such a you know a freak sight to see um and as we drive past the the policemen and women I park up Eliza parks a couple of spaces beside me and we look at each other through the window thinking what the hell is going on here um and I go to get out of my car and I notice in the rear mirror that the policemen and women are all coming over to us and I think surely not you know you know we haven't done anything wrong and uh, I get out the car the policemen and women surround both of our cars and straight away you know they say are you two friends which we respond with yeah you know we've come for a socially distanced walk you know I thought that's what you're allowed to do um they said where are you from I said you know we're from Ashby we're you know we're uh, literally two villages away from here um and straight away we got told um we shouldn't be there we've broken the COVID um law and guidelines straight away we said gosh you know I'm really sorry but you know we're we were aware that you can drive to an open space um we've come in our separate cars um we've come here because it is so open and there's that you know it's so quiet we felt that this was Mm. a safe option to do um and the policeman said no it's not you aren't from derbyshire and you've broken you've you've broken the the guidelines by coming across the border um and ashby is such on the border of leicestershire and derbyshire um and you know we were very apologetic we said we take the guidelines really seriously um i said look we've come in separate cars we've even brought our own drinks and we got told that that wasn't allowed it's classed as a picnic and i said look you know we are so sorry thinking you know the policeman might say right look come on girls things have changed you know please just Mm. go home um and he went on to caution us both and issue us both with the fine um and you know we explained you know we're we're really sorry, but this we weren't aware of this. And what was the tone like from the police? I mean, it sounds like you had quite a lot of police around you. For, yeah, you know. I mean, the, uh, there was between five and seven um, policemen and women, which obviously seemed five a lot. Five and between, seven? Yeah, and the reason that I say that is I remember five because I've seen a picture of them. Um, but I think there could have been a few more which didn't come to the car. Um, and... I, the, it just felt, we felt as though it was very hostile, you know, it made us fearful that people are, you know, pe- this is a lot of police for something, we are law-abiding uh, citizens, you know, we're two women, we're not, we, we were no way aggressive towards them, we weren't argumentative, and it just, it felt very, it was very scary, if I'm honest, to have that m- amount of police presence, you know, at somewhere which is so quiet. Um, yeah, and yeah, if you've never was, been, if you if, no. if you don't, you know, if you're never involved with the police ever before no in your way. life, there's no surprise that you're worried. So initially, the, the Derbyshire police defended themselves. They said that legislation said trips should be local, which it does, mm-hmm. and that driving to a location to exercise, quotes, is clearly not in the spirit of the national effort to reduce our travel, reduce the possible spread of the disease, and reduce the number of deaths. Uh, do you think that they're on reflection that they're right about that that it isn't in the spirit of the national effort i think um you know there's a lot of fours and against a lot of people will you know we've had great support where people are saying you know you chose the right thing you've in our local mp agreed with us saying if you know the area you'll know it's very busy you know it's a very busy town um and to have chose to have gone to somewhere where really the only things that you're going to see are ducks so how are we going to be spreading it you know we got the police said well you got your you're going to be passing this from one county to another. You know, we chose a place. We could have gone to, you know, a supermarket where it's full of people. You know, you're allowed to do that. We could have gone to, you know, 
a local C and N, me changing the name there, store where it's full of people. You're inside and we chose that. That place was just going to be so quiet. We're mm. not going to be bumping into people. Um, but like we said, you know, if we if we have broken the, the guidelines course, you know, we're happy to pay the fine. But, you know, Derbyshire Police have issued a statement to say that, you know, they should have actually followed the four E's. The National Policing um, has said that this is the guidelines for them to follow now and that all fines are actually being looked into. So, yes, it's a very grey area. Well, it is, because I think it depends on one's definition of the word local, doesn't it? And for you, of you're course. still local to your home. For the police, yes. it's not local enough. Although, I, I, you know, I don't know, Jessica, um, how you've, what kind of response you have had since this story broke. I imagine you've sort of been overwhelmed, really, by, by responses to it. Yeah. Um, but there are, peop- there, there are people saying that, that, you know, there are police officers that are messaging into the programme now saying it seems like everybody wants the police to enforce coronavirus and do our job or the, the rules unless we stop someone that does, doesn't want to be stopped and then they complain. What do you want us to do? Which is, no, I think, not an unfair means, challenge. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know, by all means, you know, to, to the policemen and women out there, I think they're doing an amazing job. Um, I just feel like, you know, these these guidelines... They are vague, you know, don't say people can travel to an open space if they can't travel to an open space. You know, how can you say you can do that, but you can't do that? Somebody's definition of local isn't somebody else's definition of local. Well, do you think, Jessica, it, do you think it would be more helpful in to, to try and avoid the situation that you have found yourself in if the government decided what local meant and put it into law? So we have a law saying you can't go more than five miles from your home. I would agree on that. The issue is, is what we found a lot of people have reached out is that not everybody is lucky enough to live locally with their family or with their friends. And that's what is the issue is that, um, you know, if you put the the, the distance of, um, of, you know, miles away from home mm. that you're allowed to be, yes, it would be a lot easier for people to know. But what about those people that need to see people who aren't lucky enough to live in yeah. the same town or the same village of those family and friends members? And, you know, going out for a walk, which, you know, we're told to do to make sure that to keep ourselves healthy, which is meant to help us against the virus. Um you and know, the law says you're perfectly entitled to do this. You are allowed to meet one other person uh, socially distanced for exercise. Yeah, exactly. And, in a public place, you know, in a public place. Yeah, yeah. You know, we said this to the, the policemen and women who, who were questioning us. You know, we we truly didn't think that we had done anything wrong. Um, yeah. We thought we were following the guidelines. But, you know, Derbyshire Police said to us, you know, they've been told that they need to start giving out more fines for for things for, for people doing this um but i just think that it needed i i watched again that the press conference with boris johnson when he initiated the the national lockdown um i watched it again to make sure that we hadn't missed something and there wasn't anything said there about mm. you know you can't cross a county border and just one thing that i do want to make clear is that um, you know, staying local to your city is actually 16 miles for us to go to Derby and it's 20 miles for us to go to Leicester. However, we've got a Leicester postcode and, you know, we, you know, absolutely, we agree to staying home, supporting the NHS. We're not people that are going against this. My brother, he's no. a doctor. He works on the COVID wards. My parents have both had this virus. It was, it was, right. it's frightening. You know, we aren't people that are doing this to say this virus doesn't exist. You know, we're not people trying to say go against the police. What we're just trying mm. to say is if this is the law, which it turns out it wasn't, then please just help people because this could have been a step too far for some people. You know, going for a walk is a saviour, as a lifeline to people just to go and have a conversation and a chat. Well, listen, Jessica, I, I'm, it's... it's uh... a. <sighs> It's very difficult. I, I completely understand. It's very difficult for police, but I think you've laid out the point very well. Um, I know this happened on Wednesday. Just finally, have you seen Eliza since? Have you met up at all in the in the days in between? No, we've not. We're neither. Uh, well, if I'm honest, um, I've not actually left the house since. So it's right. it's really frightening. You know, you want to you want to do the right thing, but when you uh, you genuinely get frightened because you're like, what is the right thing? Mm. And as I said just before, you know, we live such on the border. If I turn right out of the road, I'm in Derbyshire and left 
left I'm in Leicestershire so it really is such a fine line um, well listen Jessica let us know how it goes on the review I know Derbyshire Police are as you say they're reviewing it let us know how it goes um, and thank yeah, you for giving your side of the story and I'm sorry because you will always get it you know if you put your head above the parapet you'll get people throwing pelters at you just ignore them would be my advice <laughs> trying to ignore people that are throwing <laughs> thank the pelters you. Um, thank you very much indeed Jessica Allen who is one of the two people was one of the two people stopped by Derbyshire Police on Wednesday as you heard going out for a socially distanced walk with one other person in a public place which the law says you can do but as the, as the police officer who texted me earlier said, well, you want the police to be tougher. What do you want from us? 0345 6060973. We'll speak to a former chief constable of Greater Manchester Police just after this. Tom Swarbrick here. It's 1218. This is LBC. Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Call 0345 6060973. I think Derbyshire Police have got this one wrong, haven't they? Um, absolutely, they are there to enforce the law. I think it's a good thing that the police are doing more to enforce the law and they're going to move to fines much more quickly. Let's, let's just not beat around the bush. Let's get people to try and stay at home as much as possible. But the law does allow for what Jessica, whom you heard from just a few moments ago, and Eliza did. So why are they being fined by the police? Um, let's turn to Peter Fahey. Sir Peter Fahey, former Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police, who was listening uh, to Jessica. Thank you for hanging on the line for us, Sir Peter. Y your, your view as a former police officer, senior police officer, of what happened here? Uh, it's two things, really, uh, Tom. Number one, it will be the war-weary cry of many police officers, which I think has been reflected in your text, that they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. Quite. I think the other thing that the call highlighted was this difference between what a minister might say and what the Prime Minister said last Monday 
what is then guidelines or even versions of it are published by newspapers, for instance, and what is actually in the regulations. Uh, and my reading is, you know, what these officers in Derbyshire got confused about was what is in guidelines or what they'd heard and what is actually in the regulations. And it just shows, you know, the whole confusion about this whole issue about, um, you know, exercise and how far you can go. Mm -hmm. um, and even what Derbyshire police think is, is not really the key issue. The key issue will be is when it goes to court, if they contest the fine um, and, you know, how magistrates then interpret what the word local means. Uh, and this is why it's, a, it's really difficult when you introduce legislation overnight and you start putting in words like local, which people may think, well, we know what that means, but actually under the law, um, you know, needs a very accurate definition. And for instance, in the Irish Republic, whether it's right or wrong, they've got a very clear rule which says you cannot go more than five kilometres. Uh, and of course, that might create some injustices, but at least it makes it absolutely crystal clear for the police officer and for the member of the public. Do, do you therefore think it, it would be right, Sir Peter, to update the law to make it much clearer for everybody, including police officers, about what local means? Well, if the Home Secretary wants more enforcement, then that will need to happen. You know, at the moment, you know, as, as quite a number of people have said, there are a lot more exemptions allowed under this form of lockdown as was in the March lockdown. For instance, you know, people going to school um, and this wider definition of exercise, places of worship being open, uh, you know, a number of other things. And that makes it very, very difficult for the police officer to then enforce that. Mm. I think you will see enforce more enforcement of things like gatherings uh, and parties in houses and things like this. But this whole di definite issue about people being out and about and walking up and down the street or in yeah. parks, beauty spots... It's just really problematic and is really confusing. And at the end of the day, for a police officer to issue a fine uh, or even to end up having to arrest somebody, they've got to be really clear about what the law says. And I do well, think that, at the I moment mean, it's confused. That, that is the, the, the major criticism here, isn't it? And I, I completely understand the sim and have sympathy for police officers right now, given the job that they are being asked to do, the very difficult job that they're being asked to do. So they have sympathy or I have sympathy with them. But the minimum requirement is that the, the police understand the difference between what is the law and what is guidance. And in this case, a police officer, and it's one police officer and one incident of the many thousands that will be happening around the country, this police officer doesn't seem to have been aware of that difference, which is a problem. But Tom, Tom I, I, I'll be honest, as a former chief constable, I don't know how you do this. Because, you know, in some instances, the regulations have changed two or three, you know, certainly two twice within a week. Um, and for, you know, to train officers that are coming on and off duty 24 hours a day, to train people like the people who answer the telephones as to exactly what the regulation says, I mm. just don't know how forces are doing it. Normally, right. when a law comes in, it's been hugely consulted upon, it's gone through Parliament in great depth, there are training schemes and, you know, guides available on the internet, all this has had to be done within hours. Uh, and so, as I say, it's not really that surprising that individual officers may be getting confused uh, about it. Uh, but even then, as I say, you know, when there is certainly scope and there's room for interpretation and there's loose definitions, even if you do that, when it gets out onto the street in operational situations, there are going to be problems. Yeah. So, Peter, really good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for your time. So, Peter Fahey, former Chief Constable of Greater Manchester Police. Anne's in Kingham this afternoon. Hi there, Anne. Hello there. Hi. Your thoughts on uh, on what's happened to the, this, these two girls in Derbyshire? Um, well, um as far as I'm concerned, it is a grey area and we realise that and the police are doing such an amazing job. But honestly, Tom, what I cannot believe, no one can say that they don't know and understand that the first rule in this COVID situation is social distancing. Whether you are running, whether you are walking, whether you are on a common, there is one rule that there is no grey area about and that is social distancing. Distancing. Now, the Commons in London, London is a hot spot. It is oversubscribed in the hospitals. People are dying. It is ridiculous. And yet, the police should go to the Commons and see who are running and who are gathering together and find those people because when it touches the pockets, they will realize and word will get around don't go there unless you social distance because you will be fined. It's so important. But I don't know, Anne, even, it, again, uh, the distinction needs to be drawn, I think. I don't know that it is the law that you have to remain socially distanced. It is the guidance, and as you say, it has to Absolutely. be uh, made clear to Absolutely. people. So the, but the police but the can't fine is, you based on a breaking of guidance. 
it comes really the police are trying to help the COVID situation and find they are absolutely people. but do but do you but I mean if the if you want the police to start hitting people in the pockets where it's going to hurt to enforce them to to comply with the social distancing you have to make the guidance law to allow the police to do that but I, I I'm not sure that anybody is is genuinely saying right we'll put into law the fact that you have to remain two meters or yes, one meter plus exactly. away from me that'd be madness if there was a policeman wandering around the common and he could just break up certain of these clumps of people that don't care and just go and get together on the common, I mean, they understand that the police are yeah. trying to assist a situation that is very difficult and very hard to make a law about. But at least it would stop them from doing mm. that and from gathering. Well, listen, Anne, I, you know, I might, might I might be being very naive, but I do I can't help but think that the vast majority of people want to try and help in all of this by keeping to the regulations, keeping to the laws so that we can get we can get out of this pandemic. And thank you. David's in Leeds. Hi there, David. Hi, I'm on in here. I think I think the ladies have got a good point, but then again, if the police are unsure, your top policemen speaking that they don't even know what the what the situation is. And and these two girls have nipped out. I think it's gone to a park to have a to have a flask of coffee as well, were it? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, lots of people counts as a that. counts as a picnic, apparently, David. I no, didn't know that. I didn't know what the definition of picnic jam. was. It's You've ridiculous. got to get out. People have got to get out for some fresh yeah, air. Quite. As if the COVID don't kill you, depression and the rest of it will. But it's okay if you're an MP. You can travel from London up to Scotland, and then you can travel on a train. Ah, and get careful, your David. There are charges about that one. Careful, 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 careful. David, 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 David. There yeah. are charges about that one. So just be careful. Um, just on the uh, on the. The, the police not knowing. I mean, I, I was tempted to point it out to Sir Peter, but I thought it might come across as a bit um, bit mean-spirited. But you're right. I mean, the first job of a police officer is to know what the what the law says. I realise the law has changed a lot, but clearly these two girls knew what the law was uh, when they took to, for their flask of coffee and their, their socially distanced walk, and the police officer didn't. That's a problem. Yeah, probably right. I mean, they went, to, they went and sat down and thought they thought they were OK, and obviously now they're being charged. I'll tell you what will happen on this. They will make them into scapegoats, just to put oh. fear into everybody else not to watch what they're doing. Because we're such well, a I, dangerous I, I, point now. I don't now. know. I, I don't know, David. A bit like I, a car, right? It's travelling at fifty. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, like a car. It's travelling at hundred mile an hour. The vaccines are travelling at fifty mile an hour. Then we've got the new strain that's going at two hundred mile an hour. Do the maths. Well, I don't think you're going to slow it down by giving a fine to two ladies who are who are minding their own business and, and minding the law by having this socially distanced walk. David, thank you. 0345 960 is my number. Loads of you want to get on this afternoon about this. We'll come to more of your calls in just a moment. Plus, elsewhere, you will be aware, I'm sure, that the President of the United States has now been banned indefinitely from Twitter, his favourite form of communication. In a moment, after the news headlines, we'll speak to the former European Vice President for Twitter, who ran Twitter's business in Europe, mid the Middle East and Africa, about what this decision means for the platform and whether it's going to now consider itself to be a publisher. Talk to Bruce Disley after this. Tom Swarbrick here, 12.30. News headlines, David Dom. The Health Secretary says the UK is on course to vaccinate 2 million people a week against coronavirus. NHS England says it's begun inviting people over the age of 80 to attend large coronavirus vaccination centres which are opening this week. Rapid testing for people without coronavirus symptoms is to be rolled out across England this week. The government are encouraging those who can't work from home to be put at the front of the queue. The head of the Police Federation of England and Wales has told LBC officers need more clarity from ministers on lockdown rules. John Apter says officers are under pressure to do the right thing under a constantly changing landscape. And the weather, freezing fog and low cloud may be slow to clear from southern areas, patchy cloud and some sunshine in central parts, cloudier further north with some showers, highs of 7 degrees. LBC.
This is LBC Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick. Live from Westminster. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Oh, Steve. Tweet at Tom Swarbrick 1. Tom, is a coffee a substantial picnic with or without a Scotch egg? Come on, Steve. Come on. I tell you what, if you if you turn up with sandwiches in a flask of coffee, they'll chuck you in Belmarsh at this rate. Uh, Beverly and Derby, you're next on the radio about this, I promise. Be patient with me. I want to turn to Bruce Disley first. He's the former European Vice President for Twitter who previously ran Twitter's business in Europe, Middle East and Africa. He was responsible for the development of Twitter in three continents. On the news that Donald Trump has gone ballistic at being permanently suspended by the social media giant. Thank you for being there with us this afternoon, Bruce. Um, has your old company made the right decision? Well, it's it's no doubt an incredibly difficult one and one that I think that they took incredibly reluctantly. I think you can see over the course of the last few months that there's been an increasing number of alerts put on the bottom of his tweets, cautionary notes. I think they pretty much did everything to try and avoid this situation. But I think the consensus of the last week where five people are dead, the Republican Party have largely held the president responsible for inciting a riot. I think the context has possibly changed in the last week. The context may have done, but... There, as you know, there are arguments around what the president did and actually didn't do. And if they, if he did incite violence, there are laws around that. Why is it Twitter's job to police free speech? And immensely fair question. I think the the question that they've been asking themselves, they don't, they've they've not wanted to be part of the dialogue really of taking an elected leader off the platform. But I think, you know, the consensus in the last week, we've seen Mitch McConnell, we've seen Mitt Romney, we even saw Lindsey Graham. These are icons of the Republican mm. Party who've stood up and said what happened had gone too far. And it's really fascinating to read the announcement that Twitter made. Twitter, in the announcement, when they declared this on Friday, they said that there seems to be more violence violence being planned. Now, I saw a few people yesterday saying, oh, this is all an illustration that these tech companies are filled with woke workers. And I think probably we have to take a step back and say, five people are dead, a policeman was bludgeoned to death with a fire extinguisher, five people are dead. Is this really, we're saying that it's woke to take actions against that? So I think, well, you know, you've got, with, an, with respect, I understand that completely, I understand that completely, Bruce, but you've got, you've got people on Twitter, non-elected leaders of countries around the world, I think particularly of Iran, who have called for the eradication of another, of, of another state entirely on the platform, and they're, yeah, their accounts are still up. Now, I'm not holding you responsible for that, their accounts being there, but it seems inconsistent. Completely agree. My my strong belief when I worked at Twitter was that, and, and I've worked at YouTube previously, is that I belie believe that we could have a quality of conversation that was slightly elevated, that we maybe took a stricter line on everyone. So, you know, if someone thinks that it's their right to send a footballer some class A swear words and a, a bit of abuse, my view is, no, it's not your right to have that heard by someone. Now, I think we do get into whole discussions about the right to free speech. But one of the fundamental things about that First Amendment is that it always included the caveat that no one has the free speech to shout fire in a crowded cinema. And so consequently, you, you don't have the right to, to speak and say whatever you want whenever you want it. You don't have the right to, to say something that might cause harm to others. Well, so, look, firstly, I think... Well, you clearly really don't on Twitter. Situation. You clearly don't on Twitter, and people will take face the consequences of, of shouting fire in a crowded cinema. They, they can, of course, say it. Um, just finally, I wonder to what extent you feel that, that this is Twitter sort of having to, to kill its own monster, that Twitter, in a way, uh, accidentally or otherwise, helped create uh, Donald Trump. He used it as a way to, to help himself into, uh, uh, with, a, with a large audience and then, and then get into the White House. Uh, to what extent do you feel that Twitter created the presidency of Donald Trump and is now trying to um, put it back in its bottle at a very late stage? No, I disagree with that. When when Barack Obama was first elected in 2008, there were a lot of people saying, wow, this is a remarkable use of the internet. He's, he's rather than relying on big money, he's used the internet to garner hundreds of thousands of people donating to him. And we can pick and choose that when people use the new advent of technology, if we like how them, you use it. He didn't lie. Barack Obama did not lie on an industrial scale. 
I think, you know, what we're, we've seen is that it affords someone a microphone. Personally, I think we've seen people across the whole political spectrum being able to reach audiences without necessarily the, the editorial control. Greta Thunberg mm. uh, springs to mind mm -hmm. in the ecological movement. But it's an illustration. All of our leaders in the future are going to be adept at using the technology that comes along in the next generation. It's really good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for your time. It's a massive, it's a really interesting one, this. Bruce Disley, former European Vice President for Twitter, who previously ran their business in Europe, Middle East and Africa. Interestingly, I think it's only Angela Merkel as um, one of the uh, leaders of the biggest countries in the world who isn't on Twitter. Uh, Beverly's in Derby, meanwhile. Hiya, Beverly. Thanks for being patient. You want to talk about what went on in your county? Yes, I do. I think um, with the police needing to enforce stay at home, I think they should know the difference between the guidance and the law. And yes. from what we gather, the ladies went out and it was part of guidance. So therefore, they should never have been um, given this fine. And I think a lot of people are in support of them for this. Um, and I also think that between five and seven police officers, which was a bit heavy handed, it, it begs to belief, really. But this is how the But what are police meant to do? Like I mean, criminals. again, as, as, as police officers are, men, are, are messaging in, what, what, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to be I expect, strong, enforce, I enforce expect, this strongly or not? This is what I expect. I expect the police officers to know what law is, right? If they're enforcing it, they need to know what law is, not guidance. So mm. when somebody's going according to the guidance, they should know this is law and this is the guidance. You are the ones enforcing it. You are the ones giving out fine. Well, the police I, uh, may, so may want to say, they may, wa they may want to say five miles is not local. You're, you're told that you have to, the law is that you have to stay local and five miles yeah, is not local, listen, I'm afraid. If Here's they a fine. Know they haven't, if they know they haven't got the, it's in law to say what law is because it's ambiguous, they cannot enforce it. Do you can't? You can actually go to the people and encourage them. And I'm I'm sure those mm. ladies would have just gone home with it, you know, in an agreement. Because most people, no, are I, I think that's right. Citizens. Yeah, I think that's right. So From everything think, Jessica I think said, they were just she's too heavy-handed. And I just don't think it was necessary. And I and I, and then you have to think there wasn't very many people around because the other people been busy with somebody else. Hmm. So well, listen, Beverly, I, I think people to talk to them. That's all I would say. And I just don't yeah. think they needed to be heavy handed and they should enforce law, not guidance. And that's I think that is the minimum that can be expected, that a police officer knows the difference between law and guidance. However difficult following the, the laws have been, given they've changed so regularly, it is, after all, that police officer's job. Beverly, thank you very much indeed. 0345 6060973. By the way, if you are a police officer, you absolutely have sympathies. And I realise this is one incident of many thousands that take place. And John Apter, right at the start of the programme, I think is not unfair in saying, well, it's the media, they always focus on the, on the issues rather than the good stuff. That's not an unfair criticism. I don't think. If you are a police officer listening to this, 0345 6060973 um, if, if you feel that the police are being given a, a bit of a rough ride at the moment. Paul's in Crawley. Hiya, Paul. Hi, Tom. Thanks for taking my call. Um, really, I just first of all, like to say I have the highest respect for the police doing a very difficult job at this Agreed. time. I wouldn't want to do it. But I do feel that they're going for the low-hanging fruit and missing so much more where they could be um, intervening. Um, could I relay a situation that happened yesterday Please do. in the supermarket? Go for it. You've got about a minute. Right. Well, I went in there. Am I able to name the supermarket? Yes, if you like. Right. It's Morrison's in Rygate. And I uh, went in there to get a few bits. I was at the butcher's counter, and the butcher had his mask hanging as a chin strap. So <laughs> I thought, well, I really don't feel safe buying any of this meat. So I went to have a word with the manager and asked what the situation was. And uh, I spoke to an assistant manager and she said, oh, there's the managers over there, pointed, and there's three of them doing exactly the same. The managers not wearing, wearing, the chin, wearing them as a chin strap as well. So this assistant manager went to have a word with the butcher and she said, oh, this is a bit embarrassing. I said, yeah, damn right it is. So I went and had to word with them, knowing full well their managers, asking if I could speak to some, and totally embarrassed them. Um, meanwhile, the staff were walking about with their noses hanging out. Um, it was like a petri dish of infection. There's no spacing, no social distancing. It was scary. We just ended up having to leave. We left, I put our shopping down and left. 
and uh, after Do having you know, a Paul, word, I, I, um, I, I have massive sympathy for you with that, and I, 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 but also, of course, these supermarket workers who are wearing a mask—they have to wear it all day, and you yeah. never know there might have been reasons why they had to remove it briefly. But, but yeah. Paul, so I, I get that. Do you know, I was on the train in the way in on the way in um, here this morning, and mm-hmm. there was a bloke on the same carriage as me who wasn't wearing a mask, yeah. and I did I, I did check myself because I did think, well, I could go and say. Mm do you mind pu- putting a mask on? But then the rest of the carriage was totally empty and he might have had a good reason why he wasn't wearing one. Well, this is true. Yeah, this is true. I mean, it, there, there are people that are exempt, but, um, well, I mean, after having a word of them and then being terribly embarrassed, I walked up and down a couple of, uh, up and down another aisle, came back and she'd just taken it straight off again. So yeah. they don't care. They really don't well, care. Money's more important. I don't think they're taking it seriously. I just wonder well, if I the think, police could uh, pop in and just occasionally remind Well, they can't, people. I'm afraid, because, they're, they're, I mean, yes, it would be a m- reminder, because, Paul, as you know, I think, the um, it's not the law to wear masks in, in supermarket, otherwise the police would be there to enforce it. In fact, they've left it to the supermarket to enforce. Paul, thank you very much indeed. 0345 6060 973. We'll get more on Trump's um, ballistic explosion at the fact that he is no longer on Twitter. We'll speak to Pastor Mark Burns. Not only is he the co-founder of the Now Television Network, he is also an advisor to President Trump. He is the president's pastor. We'll speak to him after this. 12.46. Coming up at one on LBC, Majid Noirs. UK Health Secretary Matt Hancock has refused to rule out the current lockdown restrictions in England being made even tougher. Do you support tougher rules? And if so, what should they be? Majid Noirs on LBC.
Swarbrick on Sunday with Tom Swarbrick on LBC. Text 84850. Here's Dawn. Tom, you are making the job of police even harder. You have a responsibility to support them. Let the silly stories go and save lives, says Dawn. I do so I'm more than I do support the police. Absolutely 100% support the police, but I support the police in knowing what the law is. Unfortunately in this case it seems like a police officer did not know what the law was and has got this one wrong. But let's wait and see what Derbyshire police come back with. Come to more of your calls in just a moment. I'm joined on the line by Pastor Mark Burns, co-founder of the Now Television Network and advisor to President Trump. He is also the president's pastor. Thank you very much indeed for coming on the program this afternoon, um, Pastor Mark. Um, I, I see that impeachment proceedings are going to be introduced uh, from tomorrow, uh, the Democrats say. Articles of impe impeachment drawn up for incitement and insurrection. Do you think it's right that the president is going to be impeached again? Well, absolutely not. I mean, this is a posture. It is damaging to, um, to America and damaging to the, to the presidency. Um, and damaging to our republic. Um, again, this is a very, very difficult time in America. Um, and, you know, again, my advice to the president has always been to make sure this be a peaceful transfer of power, as it's always been in our great republic. We mm. call the United States of America. So this second attempt to impeach a sitting president weeks away from his um, um, from his removal of office, I think is to sustain on the presidency, and I think the Democrats are overreaching. Well, it's a stain on the presidency that the president may well himself brought about, if it is the case that um, incitement and insurrection is is uh, voted for and passed in the Senate. Well, I mean, the reality of it is, I was big, okay? Um, I was big. I spoke at the event um, for two days. Um, and, and there was a peaceful, peaceful movement that took place. I was right in the center with Rudy Giuliani, myself, Roger Stone, uh, George Papadopoulos, and others who were all there. Um, and to, uh, again, I didn't hear at all, um, you know, uh, the president's speech to incite me or any of, 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 of the patriots to want to go and storm. Uh, the Capitol. Again, first, let me just say mm. this. I denounce what took place. Violence is never the answer. Dr. Martin Luther King, whom I am a student of, made it very clear in 1968 that riot is, is the language of the unheard um, and that what is exactly America isn't listening to. Um, this is a sign that America has failed to listen to uh, uh, the people that has placed the politicians in position. So whether you're you black lives an yep. activist or a Trump patriot conservative, this is a sign that our politicians aren't listening to the people that sit in the you, you, Well, uh, or, or it's a sign that the elections, of course, were contested incredibly uh, fairly and freely, as has been found in, in all the courts that Trump has taken this to, uh, I think, bar one, where there was a, a ruling in, favor, in his favour over the distance that electoral oversight, uh, overseers were from one another, um, and, and that Donald Trump is the one that is fanning the flames of, of anti-democracy by saying that he doesn't accept the result. You used the word, just finally, Pastor Mark, you used the word patriot to describe those who were supporting the president and those who did in the end go and um, storm the Capitol building. Do you think a Black Lives Matter protester is a patriot too? I do. I do. I think they are most definitely patriots. Those who are not burning flags. Now, if you're burning American flags, then I don't believe you're a patriot. Too many men and women have died for that flag. But I believe that Black Lives Matter have a right to protest and Black Lives Matter is also a sign that people aren't listening to the cries of the people that sent them to Washington, uh, sent them mm. um, to Washington, D.C. If people were listening, then we wouldn't be having as much protest, even as Black Lives Matter. People have questioned his mental state, whether he should have access to the nuclear codes do you, uh, or whether they, they should be taken away from them, uh, from him. Do you agree that they should? Well, that's preposterous. I mean, if you know Donald Trump, you know, uh, you know listen, the race is over. We lost the race. Um, we're, we're going to accept, I'm accepting uh, um, the new administration that's coming in. Vice President-elect will be our president. But that doesn't mean that we have to still uh, 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 challenge the voting process here in America. There's just too many irregularities, even though we've lost in the courtroom. Um, th th there has to be a new way to understand yes, but how 
I understand that. I understand that. We all want democracy to be done freely and fairly. But of course, that is not the position that the president, that's only a position that the president has come to very, very late on, that his big issue has always been with uh, voting rights and the uh, the electoral process in the country, rather than what he has been saying all along until the other day was that he didn't agree with the result. Pastor Mark Burns, we have to leave it there. Thank you for your time. The co-founder of the Now Television Network and advisor to President Trump, also the president's pastor. Apologies in some parts of that interview for the quality of the line. Margaret's in Ealing. Margaret. Hello there. Good morning or good afternoon as it is now. All Thanks of it. Thanks for taking my call. You're welcome. Well, I'd just like to make a complaint. I work with the NHS. I'm not face-to-face. I've been using the buses since the first lockdown. And what I've noticed sometimes when I get on that bus, I do night work, the kids um, have designated buses, for you know, apart from the public. Bus drivers are allowing the children to get on the buses with the public. There's no social distancing. They're mm. just letting a whole crowd get on. And no one is saying anything. And I think a lot of this is causing the numbers to rise. And, we and these are groups of what, table. Margaret? Groups of, groups of teenagers who would otherwise be in school? Or what are we talking about here? We're talking about school children. I finish work right. at eight, and in the mornings I get on a bus heading home, and the bus drivers are allowing school children. They were allowing school children onto the bus when some of the buses were designated only for school children. But if and those kids are above the head- age of 11, they need to be yes. wearing a face mask. Well, I actually sat in a seat, and a child above age 11 came and sat next to me. This should not Without be Without a allowed. face mask. Well, hang on, hang Without on, hang on, Margaret, mask. Margaret. I realise yes. people are, are worried, and I, I, I understand they're worried, but, but banning banning children from getting on the bus seems a little draconian if it is the case that they're wearing a face mask and can be on it safely, no? Well, this, well as I'm saying, some of the buses in the area were only for school children. So if right. a school child gets on but they're not the at school bus, anymore is the problem. Well, this is what I said. At the time when they were at school, this was happening. And the buses were overcrowded. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. The the, the getting the kids into school was part of the difficulty of of having schools reopen. But, Margaret, if there's a a person over the age of 11 who is is on a bus but not wearing a face mask, arguably the bus driver should not have allowed them on, although that is, of course, incredibly difficult for the bus driver themselves, and maybe that's an area, again, where the police might uh, offer some greater enforcement. How? Don't know. Maybe you put a police officer on every bus. Margaret, thank you. Quick word with Phil in Horsham before we finish at one. Hi there, Phil. Hi there, Tom. How are you doing today? Yes, good, sir. Good, sir. Your thoughts on all of this? Um, Hello, Phil. (laughs) Site to me, is the definitive um, source of information for this subject. And it clearly says that the below is effective immediately. It must be followed, and it is the law. And it says there that you cannot leave your house to meet socially with anyone you do not live with. Now, I don't know what these two people were dressed no, like. But there's but, a, there, um, sorry, but there are... No, 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 that's not all of it. There is more than that. You can meet... So, you, can, you can't meet socially. You can meet for exercise with one other person who's not in your household as long as it's done okay, so, in a public but, place. But, but she said that there was, uh, they were there to see ducks and also that they'd got to take away They were there for a walk. Now, they were I there for a walk. Many people, uh, well, hang on, is uh, a walk oh, exercise okay. or not? Uh, well, I, I guess arguably it is, but then why do you need to drive somewhere to exercise? If you're that keen to exercise, you turn left out of the front you, door and you because walk as down the you heard, Because as you heard, the area that they were going to exercise in was not in their mind safe because there were too many people there. So they responsibly, I think, went to an area that didn't have very many people in in order to exercise with one another in a public place, uh, socially distanced, which they can do by law. Phil, we have to leave it there. Thank you very much. I, su- I suspect, given the volume of calls on this, this is one to continue with over the course of the next few hours here on LBC. Thank you for listening to the programme. We're back with you next Sunday, 10am. Missed anything, Global Player. I'm with you tomorrow, 10pm, for the Monday to Thursday show. Ian Payne's with you at four, right now on LBC. Majid Nawaz.
Thank you, Tom. And yes, we will <coughs> carry that on. So UK Health Secretary has refused to rule out the current lockdown restrictions in England being made even tougher. Do you support tougher rules? And if so, what should they be? After that, local and mayoral elections that were scheduled for May the 6th are likely to be delayed because of the coronavirus. A unit in the Cabinet Office is working on contingency plans to hold the vote in June, July or September even. Should elections be postponed yet again? And what are the criteria? If so, 